Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading all kinds of different remastered True Scary Stories. I hope you enjoy them. But before we get into the stories, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Aura Health. My life is super hectic. I'm a father of three, a husband, and I run two YouTube channels. Needless to say, I stay very busy. And when you've got so much going on at the same time, and you're always worried about not having enough time to get it all done, it can really lead to a lot of burnout. I'm going to be honest with everyone here. I've been struggling with burnout a lot lately, but I discovered that dealing with burnout is pretty easy by listening to the Dealing with Burnout series on the Aura Health app. Let me tell you, it's been an absolute lifesaver. The guided meditations and exercises in this series have been helping me cope with stress and find some much needed balance in my work life. But that's not all. One thing that helps set Aura apart is the level of personalization that it offers. You can fully customize your experience right down to the background noise. I love that I can pick the sounds that I want to play and I can adjust the volume of those sounds to my liking. It makes my mindfulness sessions so much more immersive and enjoyable. I can choose between music, home noises, or rain and nature noises, and I can adjust the volume of all of them. You know, I've tried other wellness apps before, but Aura is truly unique. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach like some of the other ones out there. With Aura, there's an incredible variety of meditations and practices to choose from. Honestly, it's like the app knows me better than I know myself sometimes. It's recommended guides that resonate with my preferences, and I can explore endless tracks that I absolutely love. Another aspect that blew me away is the diverse community of coaches, therapists, and storytellers on Aura. There are hundreds of them. So finding someone who truly connects with you and understands your needs becomes so much easier. It's like having a personal wellness team right in your pocket. Now, I know that you're all eager to experience the magic of the Aura Health app for yourself. So here's a special treat. You can try out the app with an exclusive discount just head over to AuraHealth.io slash Interscare to try Aura Health and save 25%. The link is also in the description down below and in the pinned comment. Don't wait any longer. Invest in your well-being and explore the incredible world of personalization, variety, and mindfulness with the Aura Health app. And thanks again to Aura Health for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most. So, now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. To the guy that tried to kill me. I am a 19 year old female French student, so please excuse my English. This event happened last week. I was heading to my apartment after seeing a friend. I took the tramway at 11.30 p.m. because I didn't feel comfortable walking at night. As soon as I sat down, a man who was already sitting nearby came and sat in front of me. I had a very strange feeling about it, so I told my boyfriend by text. Then, I stood up to get out of the tram, but the man quickly got out after me. He was weirdly following me, not walking behind me, but next to me. I was getting very anxious, knowing something was wrong, so I continued to walk to the avenue I live in. I crossed the road, and he didn't, so I thought it was okay, but a few seconds after, he crossed the road too and was walking behind me. Then he passed me and was walking in front of me so I thought I was just getting paranoid and that he was just walking this way too. 
but near my building, he stopped and waited until I met him. He asked if I had a boyfriend, and I answered yes, and sorry, good evening, as polite as I can be. He proceeded to leave in front of me, so I was walking slower for him to be far from me, and to make sure he didn't know that I was almost home. I turned into the little pathway heading to the lobby of my building, but I was still anxious about this man, even though he continued to walk. I thought I'd put my keys in my pocket, but they were in my bag. I was shaking so much that I had to try multiple times before I was able to grab them. I managed to get them, and I opened the magnetic door, but thought of closing the door immediately after me in case the man wanted to follow me in. The door was closed, but the magnetic system wasn't on yet, and the man was running to it. He pushed violently in on it with horrific eyes looking at me. The door was made of glass, so I was able to see him pretty easily. That's when I knew I was getting into real trouble. So, without even thinking, I screamed as loud as I could. And I think that's probably what saved my life. Immediately, the man ran towards me, pushed me hard on the ground, and started to choke me really hard. I was too stunned because I wasn't prepared for such a violent assault. While he was choking me, I couldn't scream at all, or even breathe. And nobody came. So I really thought that I was going to die, looking into his bulging eyes, staring directly into mine with pure hate. I'm a very small female, so I wasn't able to do anything with my arms. I think it wasn't that long, but it felt like an eternity, and I lost consciousness for a moment. When I opened my eyes again, he had just ran out, and I saw the caretaker's wife beside me. The caretaker was chasing after the man, but didn't manage to get him. He came back and called the police. The police were able to catch the man within 10 minutes, thanks to the description that we gave him. I really don't know why he did that to me, because when he attacked me, he didn't SA me or even rob me, which would have been pretty easy for him. I don't understand why his only goal was to kill. I'll never be thankful enough to my caretaker who came to help me and save my life because nobody else in the building called the police or tried to help. The man was judged three days later and is in jail now, but denied everything, even if the caretaker and myself identified him. There are no video proof of him following me. So to the man that tried to kill me, let's not meet again. So this happened in 2011. So the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit, but the situation is something that I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time, and so we were video chatting. This is important for later. I was on an online dating site. I won't say which one because I'll be dragged mercilessly in the comments. And I was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time, he was 28. We talked for about six weeks before I gave him my phone number and we took it offline to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. Two months after our initial chat, we were texting and he told me that he was out having a few beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out but I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like going to a bar. I invited him over to my place after he finished at the bar and he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection and I know how to defend myself if needed. I also had a webcam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo on a hot day, put on some makeup and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside of my house. I clicked record on my computer's webcam and turned off my monitor and then I went to let him in. It's around 10 p.m. and he comes in and we go back to my bedroom because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later he asks for some water, so I go to the kitchen to get him a bottle. When I come back, 
He said he had gotten a phone call and had to leave. After he left, I looked on my nightstand, where I put the firearm down after showing him, and noticed that it was gone. I looked everywhere for it, thinking I had put it down somewhere else. Nope, not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program, and sure enough, it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm, and he left his phone on my bed. Right then, his phone rings and I answer it. Come to find out, he's married. His wife was calling and wondering where he was. I told her everything, including the fact that he stole my firearm and I had video evidence and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know, he's banging on my door, my firearm in his hand, asking me for his phone. The conversation went like this. He said, I need my phone. Give me my phone. Me, not opening the door, but yelling through the window. Take the clip out of my firearm. Empty the chamber. Throw the clip into the bushes. The one in the chamber across the road. And put it on the ground. Him. No, give me my phone. Me. I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment. And I have you on video stealing from me. I put his wife on speaker. And she yells a whole bunch of expletives. Him. Shocked. He runs and gets in his car and then comes back. I threw your gun in the ditch. At this point, I made him empty his pockets, take his pants off, take his hoodie off, and show me that he doesn't have my firearm on him. All the while, his wife is on the phone. I go outside and get in his car, in the driver's seat, and tell him to take me where he threw my firearm. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him, being a felon, not being allowed to own a firearm ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake? Domestic violence involving a firearm. We get up the road. He tells me the firearm is there in a ditch. Then I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it, leaving him to do whatever to me if he chose. He was 6'4", 225 pounds. Me? I was only 5'3", and 135 pounds at the time. Or I could make him go get it, taking a chance of him seriously hurting me. I took that chance since I was on the phone with his wife and my phone with 911. He retrieves my firearm, brings it back to the car, and I drive back to the house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get his license plate number and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the clip and the one in the chamber in his pocket. So now, he's enjoying time in prison. So glad that I never have to meet this person again. At the time of this story, I was 23 years old. I'm a female, and at the time, I was a student. I was living alone in a small apartment complex not too far away from my school. I've never liked living alone. I was also very afraid of the dark. However, I always felt safe in my little apartment. It only had one way to get in and you needed to unlock two doors to get inside. The main front door to the building and my door to my apartment. I also used to have a few lights on, even at night and my laptop was usually playing some movie until I fell asleep. I always locked my door, except this one time. One weekend, I was out drinking with my friends, and when I was going back home, I ended up sharing a taxi with a random guy that was going to the same area as me. We both jumped out of the taxi outside my place and talked for a little while. He was about the same age as me and said he was also a student. He walked me to my front door, and we said goodnight, and I went inside. Some weeks, maybe a month later, I decided to stay home that weekend. I was just watching some series in bed until I fell asleep. Suddenly, I woke up to a voice. I couldn't really hear what the voice was saying, but I could hear that it was a man talking. I opened my eyes. The room was dark, but I could see a shadow standing in my doorway to my bedroom. I froze. My adrenaline started pumping. I couldn't scream. I just kept staring at the figure thought I must be dreaming. This had to be a nightmare. But I understood quickly my biggest fear had come true. He stopped talking and I asked quietly, Who are you? 
He took a step closer and whispered, Don't you remember me? He was clearly drunk, but I suddenly could see that it was the same guy that I shared a taxi with some weeks ago. I felt some weird feeling of relief that I recognized him, but at the same time, I was horrified. My thoughts started spinning. What did he want? Why was he here? I didn't know what to do. There was no place to run or even to hide. My first thought was to try and stay calm, so I just asked quietly what he was doing there. I was thinking about you, he said. I turned your lights and closed your laptop. He smiled. I kept looking at him. I was still in my bed. Still didn't know what to do. I felt sick of the thought of him walking around my apartment while I was sleeping, but decided that I needed to continue to stay calm. I asked him how he got in the building. He said that he had been ringing my doorbell, but I didn't open. So, he tried my neighbor's doorbell and someone opened up for him. He also went into my neighbor's apartment, but realized it wasn't mine. He then saw my name at the door and went in. I think he could see the fear in my eyes. He suddenly turned around and said, I think I should go. He stumbled out and I went after him. Right before he left, he said, you really should lock your door. I shut the door in his face and locked it. I went back to bed and cried. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I never called the police, but I told my friends the next day. The following months, someone would ring my doorbell every now and then in the middle of the night. I would get an anxiety attack every time. I never opened up, but I had a feeling that it was him. But I never saw him again. I'm so relieved nothing happened that night, and from this day, I always double check that I have the door locked. I also remove my name from the door. So to the guy that came into my apartment that fateful night, let's not meet again. Me and my cousin L are very close. We always did everything together. And have been mistaken as twins quite a bit. We'd always do sleepovers when we were teens, so when L invited me to her house, I immediately said yes. Once I got there with $30 from babysitting, we headed to the corner store to stock up on my snacks. My aunt trusted us as we were 13 and it was only a block away. When we got in, we noticed a guy about mid-thirties in the corner, just staring at him. We just ignored him and got our snacks and left. When we were walking back, L dropped one of the bags, so I picked it up and noticed the guy from the corner store walking in our direction. I thought it was weird, so I whispered it to L to not look back and to just walk to our house, which was across the street by this point. When we got there, we told my aunt and uncle, who were shocked, so they locked the doors and windows and put down the blinds. I opened the window because it was in the middle of Michigan in summer. Me and Elle watched Murder, She Wrote until I heard the faintest crunching of leaves in the front yard. I turned off the TV and told Elle to get her dad, who said it might have been a raccoon that slept in the room next to us just to be safe. At around 1am, I woke up to Elle screaming and saw her being dragged out the open window by the guy we saw at the store. I yelled for my uncle who came in and grabbed L and ran back outside chasing the guy. I grabbed L, ran upstairs, and called the police, who then arrested the guy. Turns out, he had been stalking L for weeks and was planning on kidnapping her. He had an entire collection of things we took from her and pictures he took of her without asking. To this day, I still lock all my windows. It was my sophomore year of high school. My best friend and I had driven up a mountain to a party and were driving back to my house at around midnight or 1am. 
my car was on E, and I was so nervous we would run out of gas, but I coasted all the way down the mountain. We got onto the highway that would take us back home and started driving. It was dark, as there were very few streetlights on this stretch of highway, and there were no other cars out either. The highway ran parallel to a railroad track. We drove for a bit, listening to music and chatting. At some point, recognizing how dark it was and the absence of other cars, I flipped on my high beams. The light illuminated the street in front of us, and my friend said something like, Holy crap, what is all of that? The street in front of us was stained red, as if someone had splattered gallons and gallons of dark red tomato sauce all over it for 100 to 200 meters. A few meters ahead of us, dotting the red stained ground, we saw whitish gray chunks, some the size of a can of food, others the size of a human torso, dozens of them strewn across the lane. I had to slow down and drive around some pieces. My friend and I were both freaking out at this point. After the chunks, the red stains quickly faded and we felt relieved. We rationalized that it was probably a deer carcass. It was really common for deer to cross that street. Perhaps a deer had been hit by one car and fell dead in the lane. Then another car, perhaps a semi-truck, also common in that area, in the dark of night had come and run over the body with all 18 wheels, dragging it and tearing it up in pieces. Or maybe a semi just hit a deer and this was the outcome. Either way, that made some sense to us. We got back home without further issue, and I remember getting out to check my tires to see if they were covered in blood or had bone fragments stuck in the tread. Everything looked fine. My friend went to his car and headed home and I went to bed. That next morning, I went upstairs for breakfast. My mom asked if I had heard about the car accident. I said I had not and asked her to explain. Apparently, that same night, a group of three to four teenagers from my school had driven onto the train tracks along the highway and somehow got stuck there. The police thought they must have been drunk because they stayed in the car even when a high-speed freight train appeared in the distance. The train apparently hit the car so hard that some of the kids, or at least parts of them, were thrown several meters away. The car was pushed along the tracks for some distance, and there were no survivors. I remember the hair on my arms and neck standing on end as my mom told me this. I asked her, not really sure if I wanted to know, what time all of this happened. She said sometime around midnight. She added that it was not reported to the police for several hours after it happened. I remember feeling sick to my stomach, thinking I had potentially driven through the bloody remains of those kids from my school. I, of course, called and told my friend about the story. We both thought it was too coincidental for those two things to happen just meters apart and not be, in actuality, one of the same. I was a pretty and relatively smart 15-year-old girl, a good kid who did well in school despite a tough childhood. I was working at an amusement park full-time during the summer. The area I lived in could be sketchy, but having grown up with little to no adult supervision, I was used to trying to look out for myself. My father was out of town, mother was long out of the picture, and my sister, three years older, and myself were staying at our home alone. I finished work at 11 p.m. when the park closed and walked home by myself as I usually did. It wasn't far, perhaps 10 minutes. I arrived home. My sister was still out somewhere and I got ready for bed, putting my pajamas on and crawled into bed. I was starting to fall asleep but heard a small noise. I didn't know what it was but it didn't seem like the usual house noise. My bedroom was on the second floor, with stairs leading up. I didn't hear anything after that noise, didn't investigate, just chalked it up to nothing. I started to fall back asleep when I heard what sounded like hesitant footsteps on the stairs. I was instantly awake. 
but in my mind, it was my sister coming home and climbing up the stairs where her bedroom was. Still in bed, I yelled out, Wendy, Wendy, is that you? I heard nothing back. I yelled again, Wendy, is that you? Nothing. More footsteps. I was petrified. But as I tell the story to this day, I don't understand some of my reactions that night, so I really can't explain them. I got out of bed, opened the ajar bedroom door fully, and went out to the stairs, where I stood at the top. Below me, about halfway up the stairs, was a man that I had never seen before. He looked to be in his early 20s, a little taller than my five foot seven, but not a big guy. He was solid, with blonde, curly hair. I asked him what he was doing. His reply was a garbled mess, something along the lines of, Where's Wendy? My mother told me not to get mixed up with women. Where's Wendy? From his manner and wild-eyed look, he seemed like he may have been doing drugs. He had followed me home from the park and was asking, Where's Wendy? In response to my calling out for her. For some reason, I got very angry, not just scared. I started screaming at him to get out, get out of the house, that I was going to call my father and Wendy and he needed to just get out. To my surprise, he did. He turned around, ran back down the stairs, and I didn't see where he went after that. But it turns out, he must have left. I have no idea how he got in. He was definitely there for me. That's why he followed me. Not burglary or anything else. I think the only reason he left was because he had no idea where my sister Wendy was. Thought she was in the house and it was an added complication to him getting caught. I was so shaken. I stayed up the rest of the night. I didn't call the cops. Didn't call a friend. The only person I told was my sister the next day don't know why. I just sat in a rocking chair, clutching my cat, rocking and crying, staying awake till the next morning. My sister never did come home that night. She stayed at a friend's and came home the next day. This happened 35 years ago. I never told anyone other than her until now. I wasn't sure where to post this, but I needed the validation that I'm not insane. I've never really had paranormal experiences, but I can't explain this. I'm in college and me and some other seven people from my school went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year and it was cold and Everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite, and there were a couple other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples and then two college-age girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp further away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places. And the energy in this area wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one-person tents, and we formed kind of a cluster in this site, with my tent being in the back so no one was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest, because this backpacking site was like a big cleared-off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward... I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m. and I wake up to leaves crunching right behind my tent. I hear footsteps walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like just two legs. I can't make this up. This creature was circling my tent for long periods of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of my tent and then just stopping. Then, after a period of time, it would 
move on to walking around the rest of our tent cluster. I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth when it was close to my tent, like a sort of heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this occurred for hours. It seemed like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shake from my tent. Although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow and it didn't move like a flashlight would. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply couldn't believe it was an animal. At some point, I fell asleep due to sheer exhaustion. But I could hear the heavy footsteps circling until I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it. And my leader admitted she heard the footsteps and noises as well. Admitting it was bizarre and she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said he also noticed the light that came on but thought it was someone else. Not a single person in this group went up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. I've heard things about the Appalachian regions being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Some people on Reddit have leaned towards Bigfoot, because apparently he is associated with white orbs. Never been a Bigfoot believer, but I'm telling you, this didn't feel like just any animal. Definitely didn't feel like something like a bear. I grew up in a small, rural town where nothing ever happens. The sort of place where it wasn't unusual to leave your doors unlocked and your closest neighbors are a mile or so away from your house. Our family also had this giant old cat, Tag, who was a bit of a drama king, but we loved him. One summer, when I was around 9 or 10 years old, the cat starts going ballistic. Tag generally slept in my room curled up next to me until I fell asleep, and then would get up to doing whatever cat things he did at night. Occasionally he would meow or try to wake me up on unfortunate nights when I could see the bottom of his food bowl and needed a midnight snack. Usually if I ignored him he would give up or rarely go try to wake up my mom instead. This night, however, he bangs against my parents' bedroom door until he gets in and is meowing loud enough to wake us up. Our bedroom doors were next to each other and I call to tag to come to bed because it's about 2 a.m. He's having none of it and is carrying on. My mom gets up, goes down to the kitchen, and then huffs back up with Tag on her heels still meowing insanely. She said his bowl had plenty of food and he just walked over to the door of the kitchen. Tag was an indoor slash outdoor cat, but had his own cat door through the garage, so there was no need for one of us to let him out. My mom said my brother must have left the kitchen door open and just the screen door was shut, but... She wasn't holding it open forever for the cat to just stand there and not go out. She shut the kitchen door and went back to sleep, firmly shutting her bedroom door this time so Tag couldn't let himself back into their room. I always kept treats for him in my room and offered him one, but he was still meowing at their door trying to get them up. I grabbed him and bring him into my bedroom and shut the door to get him to sleep. I lay in bed trying to go back to sleep and tag meows at my door wanting back out. I finally open my door and he bolts back downstairs towards the kitchen and that's when I heard what sounded like a door slamming. I have three older siblings though and someone is always up watching TV or running to the bathroom so I think nothing of it. The cat finally falls back into my room but instead of curling up in my armpit like usual he sat on the bottom of my bed staring at my door. I fell asleep until morning when some commotion wakes me up and I pad down to the kitchen to find my parents on the phone with the police. They got up as usual to get ready for work while making coffee. My mom went to grab her rings from the little jewelry dish she had by the sink because she would take them off in the evenings to rinse dishes and load the dishwasher, but discovered the dish was empty this morning. 
small town, so the sheriff sends a deputy over, and when my dad walks out to meet them, sees the ATV is missing up from out back. The key is off the key ring. My brothers are all up at this point, too, and we were all freaked out that while we were sleeping, some robber came in and removed the ATV key, saw an opportunity to take my mom's rings. They were asking if we had any clue when it happened, and my parents say no. My mom asked my middle brother, who was a freshman in college and home for the summer that time. He ended up off the couch last night and if he had heard anything. He said he went to bed at 10 or 11 and asked what she meant as his bedroom was in the basement and he wouldn't have heard anything in the kitchen. She said, but you were in the living room off the kitchen when I went to feed the cat and shut the door. You left open and I told you not to sleep on my couch and go to your bed as I went back upstairs. He told mom he was in the basement since dinner and never went out or came upstairs again. He watched a movie in the basement living room before going to bed in his own bedroom. She goes white and realizes that the cat must have been trying to warn us someone came into the house and the robber dove onto the couch and covered up to hide when she came to the kitchen and exited after she went back to bed. The cop said for someone to be so brazen they probably knew our family, knew our habits, but didn't count on the cat being so overprotective and then probably intended to steal more but was afraid the cat may wake up the whole house. It's been over 20 years since this happened and the robber was never caught but it is unnerving to think it was probably someone who had been to our home before as a friend. Thank God for our cat. It was nearing Christmas of 2021, and by that, I mean that it was mid-November. I live in the U.S., so... Christmas and holiday items tend to go up in October. Being that I was a 16-year-old female at the time, I always tried to get my shopping done early because a lot of my gifts were handmade. Some background. There are a lot of shops, small grocery stores, as well as the local uptown within walking distance of my house. It was the uptown where this occurred. One of my brothers, Anthony, was really into music and learning different instruments, so I decided to go to the specific store in the uptown that sold music supplies. Because of my schedule, I wasn't able to go until well after 4 o'clock, which is when the sun started to set. In hindsight, I shouldn't have tried to go out, but I was desperate enough to finish my gift shopping by the first week of December. I stopped at a local Dollar General to get some paint I ran out of, then across the street to the uptown for Anthony's music supplies. While crossing the street, I saw a large brown truck stopped at the intersection. I hadn't seen a truck of that collar in tow or ever before, so I was pretty noticeable. I also noticed that it was turning into the uptown's parking lot, same as me. One thing about our uptown is that the majority of it is bars and restaurants so there were quite a lot of people mingling around some of the bars. It did make me a bit nervous, but the music store was close, so I just decided to tough it out. As I was entering the store, the brown truck slowly crept by me. I was kind of spooked, but figured whoever was just being careful of the people. The store didn't end up having what I needed, so I placed an order for the following week and left the shop. By now, it was well into dusk. As soon as I left, I saw the truck parked right outside the store. I brushed it off as that they were just in the store next to me and went to leave. As soon as I turned my back, I saw the lights of the truck go on and the engine roared to life. I basically peed myself right there. I turned to look at who was in the car, but the windows were so heavily tinted that I didn't know they were able to see. The car pulls out and slowly creeps toward me and I'm paralyzed. I figured I was going to be kidnapped and murdered right then and there. I found my nerve to run where the car was only six feet away, and I booked it down the sidewalk. The car started to go faster to match pace with me, and the people from the bars didn't seem to notice or care. I was crying at this point, and I didn't know what to do. Then, when I saw my saving grace, 
I saw two ladies, a little younger than my mom, outside a coffee shop that just closed. They spotted me too, and I took a chance to run up behind them and told them the situation. The pink shirt coffee lady had to leave, but gave the key to the lady in the blue shirt, who offered to let me stay inside the cafe until my mom could come get me. The brown truck drove past a few times, but then gave up and left the way it came in. My mom showed up minutes later. I thank the blue coffee lady for her help, and I still go to their shop regularly. Thank you so much to the pink and blue coffee ladies, because you probably saved my life. And to the people driving that brown truck, let's not meet. I've had greeps tailgate me or try to grab my attention on the road, and I usually just ignore them, which usually always works. But the guy in this story takes the golden medal. My shift starts in the afternoon, and I was feeling off for most of the day. A beautiful, sunny day, mind you. You know, one of those days where you drag yourself out of bed to start adulting. I decided to lift my mood up, so I wore something new that I had. A beautiful creamy white faux fur vest and I hit the road. I looked like a million bucks. Feel like a million bucks, right? Maybe not. I played some piano tracks and hope that I'll get out of this funk. I just needed something to comfort me and those two things didn't cut it. While I was driving to work, I decided to grab a drink. An iced, crisp green tea will definitely lift my spirits. There were two branches of a famous coffee shop. I could have gone to the first one, the drive through but they use a pretty crappy tea brand as they ran out of the good stuff. So I had to go to the one that was inside a mall. Anything to feel better, right? I parked my car and I saw a private fleet of black SUVs making it difficult to view the entrance. This is important later. I grabbed a cold bottle of water and headed to the counter. I paid for my drink and got a cherry lollipop, because why not? While waiting for my drink, and once I got it, I started walking out. I had to pass a fountain in the courtyard before I could reach the exit. I slowed my pace as I noticed that I was walking too fast. I felt a bit off, but brushed it off. As I passed between the SUVs, a bus shot through quickly. I stopped in shock as I almost walked in its path. This didn't make me realize what was happening, as I got distracted and wasn't aware of my surroundings. As I walked further, I had to pass an area where there isn't anyone. It was shaded, but still outdoors. Almost like under a bridge-style building, if that makes sense. This was the way to my car. I noticed that I wasn't aware of my surroundings till I heard footsteps on my right. Then I saw a man in my peripheral vision walking and matching my speed. At first, I thought he was in a uniform, so I assumed he was a part of the cleaning staff in the mall. It felt off, but I told myself that I was being paranoid and overthinking things. Next to my car, on my left side, was a woman with a child who were getting into their car. This will make sense later. I was sandwiched between my car and hers. I was getting my keys out of my fur vest, and then I had to turn around in order to open my driver door, as I was a bit ahead of it. Once I turned, I saw a man standing. Looked like in his late thirties. Skinny. Average height. He had a dark blue baseball cap with sunglasses, a gray shirt with some print on it, and black sweatpants. He was wearing Crocs with socks. He was so close that it took me by surprise and I was startled. But being nice and polite is in my blood, so I assume nothing. The first thing he said was, Why are you afraid? I told him that I wasn't and asked him what he wanted. Is your car for sale? He said, grinning. I said, no. Then he started to ask about how my day was going and stuff along those lines. The heck? I don't know you. Alarm bells were ringing in my head. I smiled as to not escalate the situation. I knew I had to do something. He was blocking my way to the mall entrance and if I decided to go the other way, which is a pretty large shaded parking lot with few people standing here and there. It was nice to meet you, but I gotta leave, 
I said while smiling. Give me your phone number, he said bluntly. I just repeated the same phrase and took a step closer to my door as I didn't want to show him that I was afraid. And he said something that made me want to crawl out of my skin. Give me your phone number so I don't have to chase you around in my car. At this moment, I knew I had to move fast, so I opened my door and ignored him. He kept talking and I wasn't sure what he was saying as it felt muffled. My anxiety was higher than the tip of Mount Everest now, and I was hit with this realization that even in public spaces and in broad daylight with people around, you can lose your sense of safety in a split of a second. I closed the door quickly and locked it. My fingers felt weak, but I managed to turn on the car. He kept knocking on my window. He was so insistent. I put my car in reverse and I couldn't back out. The woman was halfway getting out of her parking spot, thus forcing me to wait. He kept knocking pretty hard and saying stuff. That moment I honestly couldn't even hear him. All I wanted to do was nope out of there. I was so afraid and just baffled. I had to look at the window to see when the road was clear so I could back out. He was standing in front of my window, rapidly knocking on it. I avoided making eye contact with him. Once the road was clear, I hit the gas pedal and sped off. I drove to random places while my eyes are fixed on my rearview window to make sure he wasn't following me. It was so hard to breathe as my chest felt so heavy and my heart was beating out of my chest. I was glad he wasn't there. This creep followed me around the mall and waited for the right moment that I was alone and threatened me to give him my phone number and was totally unaware of how much of a creep he was. My therapist will definitely hear about this. And to the guy with the baseball cap and crop show socks, let's never, ever meet again. I started working at this pizza place when I was 17 years old. This was hands down the worst and best place that I've ever worked. When I first started, I had a very crappy regional manager. He would smoke meth in the store and was never around. He also made everyone do his work for him. Anyways, he would disappear from the shift all the time, sometimes for hours. I would always end up finishing the shift and doing my closing list and I would end up leaving before he would get back all the time. It was frustrating because he would leave at the worst times, like the one in this story. One night I was serving and a group of men came in. There was about four of them. They were very flirtatious, but I didn't mind at first. Then they started taking pictures of me. They also whispered among themselves while pointing at me. I then started really getting freaked out. It wasn't like they were sneaky about it either. I went to tell my manager and he was gone. All the other co-workers were teenagers and I was the oldest one. I decided to just ignore him. I know it was dumb, but I was scared. The whole time they were there, they never stopped looking at me. They also didn't speak English very well, so if they were talking about me, I didn't know. They left after a while. It was about two hours after closing. I was finishing up and I went to text my dad that I was coming home. I figured I was going to be finishing something up in like three minutes and be out the door. The thing about my dad though was he never slept until I got home. He waited for me every night. I was the last person there and I grabbed my things and I walked out. I looked over at my car to see the men from earlier. They were parked in a car next to my driver's side door. They didn't see me yet. I tried to unlock the car from the passenger side, but I couldn't. I then decided that if I walked quickly enough to the driver's side, I could be able to go. My heart was racing. I knew they were there for me and only me. So I decided to be fast. They were all put out of the car in seconds. I quickly unlocked my door and one of them pushed it shut. They all grouped around me, and they all told me that they would give me a ride. I was crying at this point, and they were just laughing. I said, no, I need to go home. I 
tried to open the door again and they slammed it shut. I was freaking out. What did they want? I was trying to find a way out of this. I know I should have just grabbed my phone and called, but when your life is being threatened, you don't grab it. You run or fight. I personally decided to freeze. I stood there crying, trying to push past them and to get back into the restaurant, but one opened the back seat door. The others were pushing me in. I don't remember what they were saying at this point. I was so scared. Before I knew my father came blowing in the parking lot, they quickly let me go and got in their car and sped off. My dad got out of the car and came up to me and asked what happened. I told him everything. He grabbed my arm and took me to his car. He wanted me to point them out because he didn't get a good look at their car. We drove around for a bit, but we couldn't find them. Come to find out that I stalled the men long enough for my dad to get worried. He decided to come see what was taking so long and came to the store. My dad and I decided not to go to the police. It was more like I decided. I was freaked out. I told my manager the next day and he was pretty much not even concerned. He bought me a taser. That was about it. I never saw the group of men after that. I don't know who or where they are or anything of that nature. Still don't even know what they wanted with me. So, to the group of men that tried to kidnap me, let's never meet again. Most of the neighbors on our street are friendly. We look out for each other. We text, chat, and say hello when we see one another. It's a sweet feeling of community. In the past, there had been one household that wasn't interested in being friendly with any of us. An elderly woman, mid-70s, we'll call her Maud, and her son, 50s, we'll call him Don. My partner and I would attempt to wave and say hello only to be met with cold stares. Once my dog managed to slip out of his collar and run through their yard while Maud was out getting the mail. The glare that I received from her while trying to catch the dog left me with a feeling hard to shake. You know, that unexpected gut punch feeling when you become the object of a stranger's misery and hatred. Anyways, we learned quickly to stay out of her way. We barely ever saw Dawn. The blinds were always closed tight. They rarely left the house, and no one ever visited. The last time I saw either of them, at the beginning of August in 2021, Don was getting the mail while wearing blue latex gloves. I thought it was weird. In early October, one of our other neighbors reached out to ask if we had seen Maud or Don recently. We had not. Suddenly, we were all too aware that their grass was that over three feet tall. The mailbox was so full that it couldn't close anymore, and papers were spilling out into the street. Obviously, a welfare check was called. The neighbor, who had put herself in charge of directly communicating with the police, called shortly after the check and told us to sit down. Maud and Don were both dead and had been dead for around six to eight weeks. It appeared to be a murder-suicide, the assumption being that he killed her. I paced the rest of the day in front of my living room windows, watching the crime scene van pull up, the officers in and out of the front door, taking breaks to somberly chat in the front yard. And then, after a few hours, out came the body bags. The smell was something I had never experienced before, and that I will never forget. The following weeks, I thought of how many times I had walked by that house with my son and dog, while two bodies had sat there rotting. I stayed up for hours, a few nights, trying to find out anything I could. Nothing. No news. No stories. No crime reports. Nothing. So I dug into Maud's history. 
All I could find was that she had been buried in a field north of town, dedicated to the unclaimed. I kept a close watch on the house and researched the legal proceedings it would go through, since there was no kin. Looking at that house, I'd always felt cold and sad before, but now it also felt dark, haunted even. I became obsessed with Maud's story, with no way of getting answers. Her house just kept staring back at me blankly every single day. Back in the spring, my young son and I were out catching fireflies. We would stand still waiting for one to blink and run in that direction. It took us up and down the street multiple times. I know this is such a small, silly detail, but that night, I stared into Maud's yard for minutes at a time waiting to see a firefly, and I swear to God, not a single firefly blinked over there. I became so bothered by it that I stared longer. Sure that if I just stared long enough, I would see at least one, but nothing. Complete stillness and darkness. I told my husband that I hoped someone would buy the property and knock the house down. No one had any business living there now. Today, around a year after they died, doors were opened, and people I hadn't seen before were in and out, carrying bag after bag of what looked like junk. I texted a neighbor and asked for intel. He said the house and all of its belongings had been collectively sold and bought at an auction two weeks ago. These were the new owners, probably getting ready to flip the house. I typically don't shove myself into situations, but I had just spent way too much time thinking about Maud, wondering who she was, why she was so angry, imagining what strange life her and her son had been living and what their last moments were like. I knew I'd regret it forever if I didn't at least ask them what it was like inside. So I did, and they invited me in. One step into the front door, and more puzzle pieces fell into place. This was a hoarder home. There was barely anywhere to put my feet. Stacks upon stacks of old fine china, pots and pans, vintage books and records, knickknacks, and countless boxes filled with God knows what from floor to ceiling. The woman who had led me inside said, the mattress where it happened is still here. Do you want to see it? Slightly afraid that she'd think I was completely demented, but far more curious, I said that of course I wanted to see it. She led me to a bedroom through piles and leaning stacks of junk. She walked into a cramped, small bedroom with a twin-sized bed and pulled the blanket back. If you've seen what decomposition stains look like, then you can imagine what I saw. After processing, I asked, so this is where Maud was found? I think they were both in here. I'm trying to piece it all together. I haven't even started in the other corner bedroom, but I'm hoping it'll give me some answers. I'll be here organizing and sorting over the next few days. You're welcome to join me if you'd like. I told her that I would love nothing more. So after all of these months, I'm excited to have a chance to get some answers to everything I've been wondering. To get a sense of who Maud really was. To possibly find a way to honor what seems to have been a very sad life. To maybe get some clues into why her son murdered her. Her son, who I found out shortly after seeing the house, was a deeply troubled offender who was charged by the FBI for child images and soliciting a minor in 2014, and to hopefully do it without any bad energy attaching itself to me. When I was nine, I went to a sleepaway camp for the summer. The sleepaway camp itself was massive and very isolated. The kids were separated into age groups and gender. All these different groups slept in different camp areas in these wood cabins. 
My group happened to be one of the largest and most developed. And because it was right off the main road in the camp, it allowed easy access for cars to come into our area. My story happened one night when I woke up and needed to pee. My cabin didn't have a bathroom, so I had to walk down to the bathhouse, which was right next to the entrance where the cars can come in. When I left the cabin, I saw that there was a white pickup truck in front of the bathhouse with its headlights on. I found it strange, but it got stranger when I got closer to the truck and nobody was inside. I figured that the driver would be in the bathhouse, but when I got in there, there was nobody. I was starting to get spooked, so I used the bathroom as fast as possible. When I left the bathhouse, the truck was gone. There was no sign that it was even there. This shocked me as the truck was close enough to the bathhouse to where I would have been able to hear it leave, but I heard nothing. This freaked me out, so I ran back up the hill to my cabin and just sat in bed for the rest of the night not being able to sleep. When the sun came up, I went back outside to check the area where the truck had been. And there weren't even track marks, which would be impossible since the ground was very muddy. To this day, I still don't know what happened, but if the truck was even really there or not. I grew up in a mining town in the north of England. After all of the mines had closed down in the 1980s, the area went to crap. There were no jobs, no money, and nothing for kids to do. As with most of the north, towns are surrounded with woodlands and farms. So as kids, we had nothing else to do. We'd go exploring the woods and build swings, climb trees, make fires, the usual kid stuff. I was around six or seven years old when the following happened. I met up with three or four friends one morning, and off we went looking for adventures. We walked a few hours and passed a few places that we'd already explored, such as caves, farms, and woodlands. When we came to an area of woodlands that we hadn't yet investigated, so, being the curious kids that we were, we went in. We soon found a stream so we followed it for maybe 10 minutes and came to a large pond surrounded by trees. Thinking back, it was a spooky spot. Picturesque, but still a bit spooky. It was the perfect spot for a rope swing overhanging the pond. So, over the course of the following week, we went back to this pond, and after a few failed attempts, made a pretty good rope swing. Over the next few weeks, I'd go back with friends every other day, and we'd hang out around this pond. But with it being so far away, not everybody was so keen to walk so far. So the group eventually became just myself and a friend of mine. And we went from going there almost daily to just going around once a week. The two of us head over there one day, and as we're approaching the woods, we could tell somebody else had been there. I'm not sure how we knew. We just knew. We get inside the woods, grab a few sticks for weapons, and follow the stream, keeping our eyes peeled for anything unusual. We get maybe a hundred meters away from a kind of small clearing in the trees, when we both notice in the distance there were dozens of these small objects hanging from the trees. We couldn't quite make out what they were, but from a distance, they looked kind of doll-shaped. We're both on the edge at this point, but we walked over an hour. So, with sticks in hand, we slowly approached the things that we saw. We get to within 10 meters of one of the objects, and we still can't quite tell what they were. They looked like little bags of fur. Some black, some grayish, some brown. It wasn't until we were almost within arm's reach when it dawned on us. They were cats. Surrounding this small clearing in the woods, there were maybe 20 or 30 cats, dead, hanging from trees. It looked like something out of a horror movie. 
And thinking back, we should have just turned on the spot and ran. But being dumb kids and curious, we hung around for a few minutes and looked around. I don't think either of us had ever seen a dead cat before. So morbid curiosity took over, and we just walked around this clearing, poking a few with our sticks. And that's when we see him. About 30 minutes away, we see a man approaching. Typical, homeless looking. Brown coat, dirty, long scruffy beard, a dark woolly hat and hood. Once we notice him, he steps. He's just standing there between trees and bushes, partly camouflaged, just staring at us. He was carrying a white plastic bag that was sagging down by his side. I'm going to hazard a guess here and say there was another dead cat in that bag. We stand frozen on the spot for maybe about 10 to 20 seconds. Not quite sure what to do. And he's just standing there. Staring. Not even moving. Just staring. My friend and I both nope out at this point and just start running as fast as we could. Screaming. I looked back a few times and the man hadn't moved. He was just standing there facing us, watching as we ran for our stupid little lives. We got out of the woods and didn't stop running until we reached a busy road about ten minutes away. We jogged the rest of the way home, barely stopping to catch a breath until we reached the safety of our neighborhood. We both went home and didn't see each other until the next day. We told our friends about what happened the next day and never went back to those woods. We gave him the name the cat man. I dread to think what would have happened to my pal and I if we hadn't seen him and hadn't noped out of there. But I'm guessing it would have ended with us also hanging from those trees. I was about 12 years old at the time of this incident. I would often visit my cousin who worked at Dollarama. It was about a 15 minute walk from my house. One day, I went to walk to Dollarama to visit my cousin. We were at the back of the store just chatting away. My cousin then had to go to the back room of the store to grab some stuff. Meanwhile, I was just standing, leaning against the wall as I waited. I then looked up and there was a guy that was just staring at me. He had tan skin, black hair, and was wearing really baggy clothes with a backpack. It looked like he hadn't showered in days. He wasn't showing any emotions on his face, but as soon as I looked up at him, he smiled at me. Not one of those small, nice smiles. He smiled big, where almost felt like his smile took up his whole face. I got creeped out. Then he started to walk towards me very fast. At this point, his face was only an inch away from me. Still smiling. I was backed up against the wall at this point. I didn't move because I was in shock on what was happening. Then, he touched my hair and softly whispered, Linda. I speak Spanish too, so I understood what he meant. He said, how beautiful. After that, he walked away. After a minute or two, my cousin came back. I told her what had happened, and she was freaked out as well. She told me that when I walked back home, I needed to keep my phone ready to call someone if it was needed. Sometime later, It was time for me to walk home. I started to walk home and just walked past Freshco. And I see the same guy that was in the store riding his bike. I start to walk slower so I don't catch up to him. All of a sudden, he looked back and stopped biking. He turned around and biked past me. I just kept walking, trying to ignore him. Then, he biked past me again but very slowly he stopped the bike right in front of me blocking my path and he still had that disgusting smile on his face but I just quickly 
walked around him. He starts biking after me. This is when I really start to panic. So I started to run, constantly looking behind me and still seeing him biking after me. I had been running for about five minutes and I was slowly starting to get tired. That's when I stopped at the street light, look behind me and watch him as I quickly call my best friend who was literally one minute walk away from me. Put the phone up to my ear and that's when the guy stopped biking. He then quickly turned to the left and went down a different street. I quickly turned around and ran to my house that was just on the other side of the lights. I haven't seen the guy for years. However, when I was in 11th grade in high school, I saw him biking on the school grounds. I hid right away and I started to get scared, but he biked away. And that was the last time I saw him. I have no idea what would have happened if I didn't start to call my best friend. But I feel like my phone and my cousin's advice saved my life. When I was about 14 or 15, we moved to a new town hundreds of miles from our old one near Los Angeles. The new town was much older, much smaller community. and It was that old fashioned style of people living their garage doors open at night because no one was worried about security. However, my family coming from a town where you knew better, we never left ours open. One weekend, my parents went out of town leaving me home alone because they went back to our old city to visit my aunt and uncle. I didn't care. I wanted to be home alone and be able to do what I wanted. I had a couple of friends over. You know, we ordered pizza and just watched and rented movies. Around 10 or 11, everyone went home and I was home alone in this big, old, five-bedroom house. My bedroom and our family room was upstairs, so when my friends left, I just stayed upstairs with the TV on and started to fall asleep on the sofa. At around 1 a.m., I suddenly woke up. don't remember if I heard something or felt something, but I woke up almost in a panic. I heard noises from downstairs. I realized I was in the dark with only one light from the TV on. A family room light had turned off for some reason, but I didn't remember ever turning it off. I jumped up and started turning lights on from upstairs. I heard footsteps in the dark downstairs as you can hear walking across the tile flooring. My dad kept a shotgun in a case upstairs in the spare bedroom. I knew how to use guns my entire life and he trusted me with it. I grabbed the shotgun and it was a single shot. So I loaded one shell and put three more in my pocket. I walked very slowly downstairs and the stairway had a little light as the light switch downstairs lit the bottom half. I make my way to that light switch, then the front room lamp, then the kitchen light. I go down the hallway to the bottom floor bedrooms turning on every light I see. I don't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary. I check every room, especially my parents' bedroom and bathroom. I figured that this is where a burglar would go for cash or jewelry. I don't see any windows or doors open. I started to think that maybe I was making myself more hyped up over nothing. So I started making my way back to the stairway in the front room. That front room had like a living room that my mom always called the sitting room because we were not allowed to hang out there, but it's where guests would sit, you know, a fancy room. Anyway, that room had a front door, the stairs leading upstairs and off to the side, the door to the garage. When I checked that our front door was locked, I then turned to the garage. I see that that door was unlocked. Note that we locked the door 
leading from our house to the garage all the time. Something inside me dreaded to open it, but I figured I had to check there too. When I opened the door from the house to the garage, I nearly crapped my pants. The big garage door was open. This was impossible. My parents had left earlier that day, and I know for a fact that the garage door was closed after they left, because when I was cleaning up my room for when my friends came over, I took all my dirty laundry to the garage. I would have noticed it was closed at this point. Also, when I said goodbye to my friends, I walked out with them, and for sure I would have saw my garage door open at that point. Anyway, I turned on the garage lights, and the garage was empty. Just the big door rolled up, so I hit the button to close it and locked the door from the garage to the house. I went back upstairs and pretty much stayed awake all night with the loaded shotgun next to me. The next day, I put the shotgun away, unloaded. I go outside to see if someone maybe forced the door open. No tool marks or anything. I look through the garage and notice that someone had opened my dad's toolbox. I couldn't tell if anything was missing, but it did in fact look like someone had went through things in there. I decided against telling my parents what happened when they came home, but only if my dad noticed something missing from the garage. Mostly because I didn't want him to blame me for leaving the door open when I clearly hadn't. Also, I didn't want them to not leave me alone home again. I do wonder if what shook me awake was the noise of the garage door opening, but I was too sleepy to realize it. I am a 17-year-old male. And last Friday night, I was home alone while my family stayed in their cabin a few kilometers away. I'm used to staying home alone as this exact scenario was very common in the summertime, especially while I'm working and can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore, used to the odd creaks and settling noises of our old house. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night, and most noises could be attributed to him, and if anything were to happen, he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he's the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the doors or windows, so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday, the sound of his barks at nearly 12 a.m. were very concerning to me. Despite my effort to stay home alone, I'm still terrified of the premise of a break-in or some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway, and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few minutes too long, and I finally got out of bed. I sleep in the basement, so I walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door. I was comforted for a moment until I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep, and saw the door open about two or three inches. I froze. I'd let the dog out earlier, but I know I closed the door. I've never left this door open. I'm a paranoid person with bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins and the like. So I would never, while I'm home alone, forget to close this door. I am 100% certain. However, at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts or even acknowledge that I couldn't have left the door open because I knew that it would send me into a spiral, possibly even an anxiety or panic attack if I didn't explain this away. I closed and locked the door, double-checking that it was certainly locked, using the flashlight on my phone 
I looked around the entire second floor of my three-story house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots, just to put my mind at ease, and upon finding nothing, went back downstairs to my room. As I was laying there, trying to push away the fear, I could hear the dog walking around the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps accompanied by our dog's footsteps. He walks around for about 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and tuck myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2 a.m. the same night, my sister comes home from work. I woke up a few minutes before this to let the dog into the basement. I woke up a few minutes before this to my dog in my room, which he never comes into. There's even a gate to stop him from getting down there, whining at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in. We let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door leading him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work for the next few days, and forgot to mention to anyone until tonight. My sister and mom were home with me for a movie night, while my dad and brothers stayed at the cabin. I remember the door situation when we were picking out horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again. The same door that was locked from the inside and not opened since earlier that night. My stomach dropped and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. Maybe she had let the dog out and forgot to close it until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. Then, we were trying to justify a reason someone would break in and not steal anything, and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me, then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then, this hypothetical person will be trapped up there now thinking that this house that appears to be empty with the rest of the family gone and all the lights off was not actually empty and there was a dog who would bark if anyone showed themselves again alerting me to their presence then when I was in the basement and my sister was in the bathroom they ran out the glass door which is timed perfectly to when they found the door open once more much wider than I found it as though they were only in a hurry on the way out Perhaps they left it open the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the door frame. Either way, it ties together too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely, especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins with nothing missing, vandalizing, or just breaking and enterings many, many times. So it's not as unlikely as it may be in a bigger city. I can't make sense of this. And I'm shaking it up, thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I was asleep, alone, in the basement. There's a part of me that doesn't believe it, but I can't shake the many coincidences that all tie together to make this concerning as it is. I certainly am glad that my searching came up empty that night, and I did not meet this person face to face. This happened some years ago, when I was 20, I think. I was going on a road trip of a sort with a really good friend of mine and his family. Our destination was a concert in a country next to ours, but we would be stopping at night to sleep in the camper that we drove in. We hadn't crossed the border yet when we stopped at the first campsite for the night. Now, it seemed like a pretty family-friendly and safe place, so... None of us had our guards up or anything. That night, around 11 p.m. or so, while my friend and his family was getting ready for bed, I went outside to get some fresh air. Our camper was almost completely next to the beach, so I went down to the shore to dip my feet and get some much-needed quiet time by myself. 
On the way there, I pass by a beach shack, a detail that will be very important later. As I stood there, letting the waves lap over my feet, I noticed the silhouette of a man further down the beach, but it was a public space for campers, so I didn't think much of it. After being absorbed by splashing in the water with my feet and enjoying the moonlight, I decided to make my way back. Of course, it was very dark given the late hour, but I don't scare easily. Now, as a woman in the modern world, I usually do stay on my guard after dark, but that thought never occurred to me since I felt that I was in a safe environment so close to the campsite. Anyways, as I was walking back, I noticed that the silhouette of the man further down the beach was gone. But even more worrying was the fact that I was nearing the beach shack. I saw that someone seemed to be trying to hide from my view behind it. Immediately, I was on alert and called a friend I knew would be awake. I gave the shack a wide berth while talking loudly to my friend about how she was coming to meet me. After not too long, I got safely back to the campsite and hopped in bed in the caravan. I didn't tell my friend or his family, because even though I was scared, there could have been many logical, non-threatening answers to what I saw. I put it out of mind, and the rest of the trip went off without a hitch. About a year or so later, I was talking to my friend about the trip, and suddenly remembered the creepy experience. As I told him, he slowly got pale, though and told me something his brother had told him and his family over breakfast some months after the trip. That same night, after I had gotten back and gone to bed, his brother had gotten up late that night to get some water. But when he passed the window right by his bed, he saw a man standing right there outside looking in the window. As soon as he was seen, the man left, but it definitely creeped out the brother a lot. But just like me, he seemed to put it out of his mind. Now with both of these stories, it doesn't seem far-fetched that the man hiding by the shack had followed me back. I really am scared to think what would have happened if I had been alone. So this happened to me when I was 11 or 12 years old, over a decade ago, and I still remember it vividly. At the time, I lived in a semi-detached house with my mom, dad, and sibling. It was decent sized, but the most impressive part was the garden, which essentially had three levels. The first level was concrete, the second grass, and the third also grass. It had my trampoline on it. At the very end of the garden was a tree embankment. The area I lived in was somewhat hilly. One morning, I woke up to a crackling sound, like a snapped branch, and I was worried since a week earlier, a tree from the embankment had fallen onto our neighbor's garden. My bedroom was at the back of the house overlooking the garden, so I opened the curtains to see if another tree had fallen. Instead, I saw a guy hiding in one of the trees in the garden. He was pale with blonde hair and wearing all black clothing. He was looking directly at me, presumably because he saw the curtains move. He started smirking and moved his finger in a come here motion. I totally freaked out and shouted for my mom and dad to come into my room. I was so scared, I physically couldn't move. This was super early in the morning, by the way, maybe around 5 a.m., so it took my dad a good 30 seconds to get in my room, at which point the stranger had already hidden behind the trees. I remember being really shaken up. I was crying whilst I told my dad what happened. He went out into the back garden to see if he could spot the guy, but he was already gone by that point. A bit of time had passed, and I'd started to forget about it. Then, about three months later, my mom and I were watching TV together after I'd finished school. The doorbell rang, and my mom went to answer the door. I looked out the window of the living room where we all sat, and we saw a white van parked outside. It was the same van as my uncle's, so I walked out of the living room and into the hallway to say hi to him. When I got to the porch where my mom was stood, I realized it wasn't my uncle. It was the same guy that I had seen in my garden a few months prior, and it really freaked me out. 
He noticed me as I walked behind my mom and gave me the same smirk as when he was in the garden. I wanted to say something to my mom, but I couldn't. I was freaking out inside. Anyway, he just asked my mom if she wanted work done on the driveway. She said no, and he left, got back in the van and drove off. He didn't give her a business card or anything. The van didn't have any company branding, and he didn't knock on any of the neighbor's doors. I told my mom that it was the same guy as soon as he went, and she started to feel uneasy about the situation too. A month or so after that, I got my first job doing the paper round. I had to deliver around 300 papers with my best friend at the time. It was getting towards winter, and it was dark by 4.30. We'd been doing the job together for around a month. When the one evening after school, it was super dark and rainy. We were halfway through delivering the newspapers and a van started following us, driving really slow, at the same pace that we were walking. We clocked that it was following us after about a minute, and we started to panic as I noticed that it was the same guy again. We left the newspaper trolley and started walking quite fast up the hill. We were about a 10 minute walk from my house. I rang my mom who made me stay on the line while she left the house to meet us. She told us to go to the corner shop that we were about a minute away from. When we made it to the shop, the van sped off really fast. The police were called. We came to my house for a report. We told them everything. That was the last time I ever saw the creepy stranger. But I still remember what he looked like so vividly. So this happened a couple days ago. I live in the suburbs of Northern California with my parents in an upper middle class neighborhood. My parents are away for their anniversary, so I've had the place to myself for the week. So I got home from a late shift at work around 1 a.m. I go inside, shower, then I head to the kitchen to make some buffalo wings for dinner. I crack open a beer and sit in front of the TV. I was sifting through movies to watch on HBO Max when all of a sudden, the doorbell rings. I actually startled me to the point where I actually jumped off the couch and knocked my beer over in the process. It's now 2 a.m., and there was no good reason for anyone to be at the door at this hour. I just started in the direction of the door for several seconds before it rang again, followed by rapid knocking on the door and window. Now, for whatever reason, I was no longer scared, but more annoyed at the fact that some idiot would think that it's an appropriate time to be banging on someone's front door. I headed over to the front door, unlock the deadbolt, and pull it open, leaving the chain in place. In the heat of the moment, I did not think to look out the window first. I just yanked the door open. Standing on my front porch was a woman in her mid-twenties with long silky black hair and a purple hoodie with black pants. I said, can I help you? To which she responded with, yeah, sorry to bother you so late, but my boyfriend and I are having some car trouble and our phones are dead. We were wondering if you could possibly let us use yours. She pointed up the street to a dark colored sedan parked underneath the street lamp and said, see, that's us right there. Now, had this been any other person, I'd have said no but she looked innocent, like she was a college student. I do live in a college town, after all. And it wasn't uncommon for college kids to be out late on a Friday night. I asked her where her boyfriend was, and she said he walked to the gas station to see if anyone had a phone there. I pulled my iPhone out and told her to make it quick as I was about to go to bed. She thanked me and said she'd only take two seconds. She took my phone and dialed a number and put the phone up to her ear. After a couple of rings, whoever she called picked up and said, Yeah, it's me. I'm borrowing someone's phone. She stopped talking, and I could barely make out a man's voice on the other end. Now, at this point, I started to feel uneasy. She was taking a lot longer to be done with this phone call, and I started to get impatient. The whole time, she just stood there, staring at me with a wide-eyed expression and a creepy smile that looked forced 
while this person on the other end kept talking. She finally said, okay, bye, and handed me my phone back. She then said, do you think I might be able to come inside and use your restroom? I said no and wished her good luck before shutting the front door. Right as I was about to walk away, I heard her laugh and say, you made the right choice. I looked out the peephole, and she was still standing on my porch. But now, she had a man standing next to her. She looked to be around her age and was wearing a hoodie and face mask. The pair then started to circle around my house, banging on windows and laughing. I didn't hesitate to call 911. They stuck around for several minutes, trying to get in through my back door. I had my Glock 19 in hand aimed at the back door with 911 on speaker and was prepared to do whatever I had to do if they got in. They banged on my back door for around five minutes before they finally left. I watched them run up the street to that same black sedan that I mentioned earlier and take off. Cops showed up in a few minutes later and took a report. They told me that I was the third person to call them that night reporting a suspicious couple attempting to enter homes. I didn't know what they had planned, but I'm inclined to believe it was nothing nice. Moral of the story is never answer the front door at 2 a.m., especially without looking to see who it is first. I know that I learned my lesson that night. My boyfriend and I recently decided that we wanted to take the new tent we bought on its first trip. The tent was one that hooks up to your car to provide more storage space, and we were excited to try it out. We had planned a kayaking trip the next day at a kayak rental shop. It was supposed to be a nice, inexpensive, outdoorsy weekend getaway. We tend to book things last minute, so all of the state parks and professional campgrounds were full. This led us to a website that is essentially an Airbnb for campsites. The place we chose was a 100 acre property just 20 minutes south of the kayak shop. Of all the sites in the area, it was described as having working bathrooms and showers. It allowed for campfires and all the sites were car accessible, important for a car dependent tent. This site was also the most reviewed in the area with three five out of five star reviews. The area was very rural, so we didn't think very much about the low number of reviews for any of the campsites. The renter was Mary, who only ever texted us updates, but seemed sweet. We start out on our two hour drive a bit later than anticipated, which put us behind the 11 a.m. time we had originally informed the host. But we tried to keep her updated with the new schedule. She told us to let her know when we arrive at the address she sent us. We arrive to the address and are greeted with the barn from the pictures. It had string lights all over it, seemed fairly new, and just gave a nice feel to it. We sit in the car for a minute and struggle with cell service to text the host to let her know we had arrived. Ten minutes after our text sends, a sweaty man who appears to be in his 60s pulls up in an ATV. He lets us know that he is the father-in-law of Mary, and she is busy taking care of the seasonal harvest and sent him instead. She lets us know that we can take the car anywhere on the property and offers to show us around with the ATV. My boyfriend, visibly uncomfortable, declines the offer and asks a few more questions about the woods and how far into them are we allowed to take the car. Anywhere. There are no designated campsites. We can go anywhere. And the ATV man even offers to help pull my car out if it gets stuck. We ask one final question about cell service. And he jokes that if we aren't from around here, we will understand that reception works better on one side of the barn than the other. I am from around here and thought it was funny. But once he said that, I realized he didn't have any ounce of an accent for here like he should. Eventually he leaves and we begin exploring the property on foot. The barn is nice and maintained. It was fully lit in the middle of the day, and with the string lights decorating the interior too. 
It is insulated and has a working kitchen. The only warning we got was to not drink the water. It seemed like a place that would host small 50 guest weddings. We walk past a shed out behind the barn to get to the trails that ran through the woods. After going through a hike that my car would have never survived, we decided it might be best just to camp by a small creek. And we chose a spot to the side opposite the barn. We were still within walking distance, but we used my car as a buffer to feel more isolated. We choose our spot and then go into the main town to eat and walk around. We message Mary about the fire policy and she tells us they will deliver a fire ring to the barn for us to take to camp. We arrive back at the barn about an hour and a half from nighttime. We drive by the barn and the lights had been turned off. We assumed it was on a timer as to not waste energy or money. We also noticed the fire ring had not yet been delivered. We start the grueling 30 minute setup in the sticky heat and reward ourselves with a set in the air conditioned car. We notice it looks like it's about to rain. So my boyfriend and I pull out a card game and wait for it to pass in the car. It only lasted about 10 minutes, but it started to be sunset. The tent held up nicely, so we felt okay leaving it for a second. Needing to use the bathroom, we start walking towards the barn. As we cross the creek, we hear what sounds to be like someone in a shed moving things around. A bit unsettling, but I tell my boyfriend that maybe they used equipment today and it's just sitting in there making the cracking cool off noise that it sometimes does we get to the barn and the lights are still off but the fire ring is there we go in and check to make sure the power is off and it's not just the lights outside none of the light switches work so we assume the power is good again maybe it's just on a timer no worries we step out of the barn and get 10 feet away. We hear a hum in the distance to the opposite side of the shed. The power to the barn is restored. We change direction to use the bathroom. As soon as we step inside, the power cuts. I start to get a weird feeling and I can tell he has it too. I look to my boyfriend and say, maybe they're just watching us. I immediately follow it up with, no, that's a lot worse. We walk back outside and the lights turn on. My boyfriend says that we need to leave and I have the same gut-wrenching primal fear. We put the ring back by the barn since we had moved it 10 feet and the barn lights start flickering. We briskly walk back to the car. Being from Appalachia, I know better than to run. The 30-minute setup was torn down and packed up in five minutes. We jump in the car and lock it. I managed to get my car going thanking God that the rain did not get my car stuck. We start towards the driveway, and just as we made it to the road, my boyfriend looks back and sees a man standing by the shed, watching us. As soon as my car pulls off onto the road, we get a text from Mary, letting us know that the fire ring is out by the barn. She also informs us that we are welcome to stay in the barn if the rain had messed up our camping experience. We arrive at a nice hotel, willing to splurge for safety. At this point, it's 10 p.m. at the earliest. A sweet older lady checks us in, desperate for validation and just comfort from anyone. We tell her what had just happened to us at the campsite. She looks shocked. She asks if we'd seen the news lately, which we both respond that we had not. The lady tells us that couples in the state have been going missing. All of them had gone camping. Three couples were truly missing and one was recently found on the side of the freeway, slashed to near death. They are, to the time of posting, still recovering in the hospital. We couldn't find many articles about where in the state, but the look on the lady's face suggested that it was near us. We get to our room and text Mary back to tell her we are not staying. Thank you for staying with us. We lock the door and I break down into tears. I will not forget that feeling I got at the barn. The primal flight or flight feeling and the feeling of being watched. I feel it in my throat just writing this. I never want to experience that again.
this is a messed up story with so many details that I'm not sure how to structure it, but I'll do my best. I'll probably forget to add some parts. I'll divide it into chapters and parts so that it'll be easier to navigate through. I used to live in Stockholm, Sweden. There, I attended high school and met my then boyfriend, Jack. He's going to come into play later. I was very active on social media then. I had Giphyo back when that was a thing. I used the GIFs to link to my own blog to show makeup, hairstyles, etc. For those who don't know what Giphyo was, it was basically Instagram, but only for GIFs. Back in the early day, I had a pretty large following on that site, but the site had its downsides, particularly the nasty, sexual messages you could get quite often. Part 1. The Meeting Then, this person, Robin, started following me, and was so nice and friendly. It felt genuinely like Robin wished me all the best, and made me happy whenever he or she would write. Robin said that he slash she was a male, 23 at the time, and was from the United States, but that he had Swedish relatives. I thought that was pretty dope, and we would chat a few times a month in English. I also love to sing, and I uploaded covers to YouTube. Robin would be so excited when I released new covers and compliment me, and I'd feel great. It was so nice to have an online friend who seemed truly happy for me, though this behavior started to become too much sometimes. It started to feel wrong. Part 2. The Flags Robin then sent me a drawing. He said it was a portrait of me. It was a girl with animal ears, making a cute pose with her hand, piercing green eyes and whiskers. He said it was like me, but mixed with a cat, my favorite animal. I was beyond impressed. It was so cute, and I was so flattered that someone would draw me. But that excitement turned to ash in my mouth one night. This is where it all started for real, where the flag should have gone up. I play League of Legends, and one of my favorite champions back then was Ari, especially in her Foxfire Ari skin. I was scrolling through Safari on my phone to find a wallpaper of her to have on my phone. And then I see a picture. The fan art Robin made. Only that the eyes were not yellow, like Aris. I clicked the picture and it linked me to a deviant art account. The caption was something like, Casual cute Foxfire Ari, posted three years ago. I wrote to Robin, and told him how upset I was that he stole a drawing from an artist. Edited the colors a bit and claimed to have worked hard making it himself. I explained to him how awful it is to take someone else's work and say that you yourself made it. He said he was ashamed and sorry, and said he only wanted to impress me and make me smile. I couldn't stay mad at him for long, but I was wary now. It had been a while since I posted a cover. I posted a cover a few weeks later. Part 3. Too Close to Comfort I broke up with Jack, my boyfriend. We went our ways, and it was okay. Robin, on the other hand, was not. He couldn't, for the sake of humanity, grasp why we had broken up and pleaded yet again. But this time, it was a pleading for me to get back together with my boyfriend. I tolerated this at first because, to most people, we seemed perfectly happy together, Jack and I. I recently really got upset with him because, after a few days on end, he would ask me if we were getting back, and I just explained that Jack was unfaithful, seeing other girls flirting with him. The response... Oh, but can't you forgive him? Not getting back? I was done. I told him to leave me alone and he did. Part 4. Found out. I was just like last time, scrolling on the internet and thought one night that I wanted to listen to others doing the same cover that I did. I started scrolling through the list and I see my face on a thumbnail with the caption, song name, cover by me. This was not my video, not my YouTube account. My heart froze. I felt myself grow cold. I clicked and my audio started playing. It was my voice. My picture. But not my name. I clicked the profile and the coldness intensified. Every cover of me. Every video of me from my own YouTube, Instagram, Friends YouTubes, Jack's YouTube, and SoundCloud was all on there. The videos dated back two whole years. The account said that her name was Jenny and that she was the one singing, producing the music, even going as far as taking videos of my relatives and saying that it was her family. I was confused, scared and angry. Who would do this? I got my answer with the most twisted thing I've experienced online. 
in the comments to the videos were comments from Robin's account. Robin, thank you so much, Jenny, for dedicating this song to me. Jenny, oh, no bother, Robin. I made it all for you. It was like this stalker was either two stalkers or this person that made up two characters and was talking to himself through the comments. This freaked me out big time. I wrote to all my friends whose content was stolen, wrote to my ex and my new boyfriend, my now fiance, and told them to help me shut this thing down. The account was shut down within 20 hours. I blocked all accounts linked to Robin, including the Ginny accounts. I locked all social medias, removed everyone that I didn't know IRL. I reverse image searched all my profile pictures and nothing came up. I was paranoid for about a year after this. I didn't trust anyone that I didn't know in real life. Part 5. The Aftermath Robin made new accounts to follow me, which I blocked. I have an official Instagram for work and such, which he could be looking at. But it's something I've just now accepted will happen, and that I shouldn't live in internet fear because of one person. Just a month ago, I logged into Tumblr, because I wanted to see if I had some juicy memes stashed there somewhere. Yeah, I know. Cringe. Then I saw blocked accounts. Only one blocked. Guess who? Robin had changed the Tumblr blog from his Robin fakery to something new. Something personal. The blog was filled with angst, just like all other Tumblrs. But this one was filled with self-hatred posts, extremism, racism, and long posts written in Swedish. This was the first time it hit me. This person was Swedish. I told my best friend to go through the blog to see if her FBI skills could sniff something out. And she did. I'll lay out all the evidence that her and I have come to know so far. Conclusion Part 6 The stalker is probably born in 1989, and he lives in the same part of the city as my parents, where I lived before. Gender, we're not too sure. It seems to depend. The stalker couldn't go to high school with me, but must have known me through something else. Maybe mutual friends or something. He or she stole my content for years, pretending to be my friend to get more content, and is probably still checking in on me. My best guess is that it was a girl who wanted to be me, have my life and my boyfriend. When I stopped creating new content and broke up with Jack, her whole made-up world started to fall apart. If Robin somehow reads this, I hope you'll find acceptance and happiness in yourself. Because it is no life living it through someone else. Go in peace. And I have, to this day, still no clue who Robin really is. This is a story that's hard to share, but it's also something that I desperately need to get off my chest. It's a story about learning the true meaning of naivete and deception. The story of destruction and of rebirth. I guess it all started about three or four years ago, when I had been working at my first job for about two years. That was the year that I would meet the two men that changed my life forever. One for the better, and one for the much worse. The restaurant I worked at had been bought out by a big company, so there was a big overhaul in staff and everything else. A whole new set of managers and some new wait staff as well. One of these men would become my boyfriend three years later, and we're still very much in love now. The other, let's just call him POS, because I can't even think of his name without getting upset. POS started as a manager at that time. I never took much note of him. He was nice enough and seemed funny. I worked there for a while, getting closer as a friend to my current boyfriend. I then left that job for a good six months before returning to it. At this point, most of the staff had changed because of high turnover. I only knew about three of the workers, one of which was POS. Flash to about one year later, where him and I are okay friends and I'm well into dating my boyfriend. He starts giving me compliments and love bombing me. He constantly found my weak spots and tried to make them better. He always tried to buy me things and get me to work more hours with him. I learned many things about him during this time. I started to notice how very unstable he was. The dots started to connect and I remembered how many fights he'd gotten into in his defense or for the restaurant. 
I started thinking about his weapon collection and how off his voice was when he said, I had you picked out from the moment I met you. In my biggest moment of weakness, when I felt ugly and vulnerable, he made me feel pretty, and I made what I believe is the biggest mistake in my entire life. I listened to him. I sent him pictures that could destroy my relationship. I was naive in believing all the ways he related to me. He was just a great liar. He even joked to me about his masks and his nine other personalities. I want to go back and slap myself for not putting it all together faster. The crazed look he got in his eyes sometimes. His breakdowns. So much of it were red flags that I didn't see. He knew how to manipulate me and the people around me. None of it even hit until about a week after I quit that place. Then, one night, out of the blue he starts messaging me. Things start escalating because I had told him that there would never be anything between us the last time I would seen him. He starts ranting about justice and how he could see through me and my lies. He said I needed to tell my boyfriend about us, or he would. I told him there wasn't an us, and that it wasn't his business. He kept insisting that he loved me, and that we needed to be together. He couldn't take no for an answer, even though he kept asking and asking for me to tell him that it was over. I told him, and he couldn't take it, that it got worse. He started talking in third person, calling himself Jack the Ripper, saying he was going to find me and find my boyfriend. I was panicking in my room, crying and throwing up, all while trying to deal with this. I asked him what he wanted, and his only reply was you. I've never felt that kind of fear before. I started thinking about how much I love my boyfriend, my amazing, perfect boyfriend, who has been with me through everything, and it helps calm me down. That's when I march to my boyfriend's room, set him down and tell him everything, and we talk and he forgave me, and it hurt. And I still haven't completely forgiven myself for hurting him that way, but I'm hoping one day I will. I messaged POS and told him I already told my boyfriend and that he didn't have any power over me anymore. He then started grasping at straws, threatening my other job, where I work with children, even threatening my PlayStation account. He's a genius. He's insane. I called him by his name while he was talking in other personalities, and he told me to call him Jack. Or there would be consequences. I blocked him on everything. I deleted my Facebook. I disconnected from everyone who works there. And I spent an entire day speaking to police and the principal of my work. While talking to the police, they told me that soon he'll find someone new to target so I could rest easy. But that didn't make me feel better. I still felt sick because even if it's not fixated on me, that doesn't mean that some other poor girl deserves him to do that to her either. That experience with the police changed me. What do you do when someone says you have to be with them or he'll kill you and the person you love? I don't know and I still don't. I still have nightmares. That Friday while I was driving home from work, I got pulled over because an anonymous person called in describing my car and license plate, saying that I was drunk and on drugs. Huh. I wonder who that was. I calmly explained to the officer that I was coming home from work and gave him my case number. I got about eight calls a day from different random numbers for about three days after. Months later, after so much work and therapy, I see him twice in one day. I know his car, so I pretty much get anxious whenever I see the caller or make of that car anywhere. One day, my worst fear happened. I was just on my way to a doctor's appointment and my turn was literally one light up. I pull up to a car that is way too familiar to me, and I notice that there is no way for me to escape. He knows my car. My windows aren't very well tinted. I see the shadow of his hair move, and know it's him, and my stomach rolls. I pull out my phone and call my mom, shaking so bad that I had to redial twice. I ended up making five different turns to get to the doctor instead of one, and I parked very hidden. I was very proud of how calm I was when I walked in for my appointment. It was very hard. After my appointment, I meet with my best friend, and we go to walk her adorable dogs around our house. This guy knew where we were, because my car was right there at my friend's house, and I see familiar movement in the corner of my eye. I seriously went cold. I see him walking, 
and start to cross the street to the side we were at. I didn't have anything to say. I just dragged the dogs around the corner and kept turning and going until I felt safe. When I explained to my friend what happened, she helped me calm down. And honestly, I'm just very thankful that she was there. I am now writing this seven months later. I'm still undergoing therapy for this, but I've started to do something very important. I've been reclaiming my space and my mind. I have slowly started to reach out to old co-workers from that restaurant. And I even went outside of the restaurant to say hi to managers and servers that I used to know. I found out the next day through my good friend that works there that he said he was uncomfortable with me being there. I laughed. I genuinely laughed really hard. And then I went back for the next three days to pick up my friend from there. Just to make a point. I haven't been strong enough to go inside yet though. So many of my nightmares are placed there. I can smell it. I can hear the glasses clinking. And it makes me shake. There's a certain shade of blue he wears. And if I see it, it makes me shake. In every dream that I have, that collar is always lurking in the background. His presence is always felt. There is a big festival that includes that restaurant every year. It's so much fun, and it would be the first year I could go in four years because I always worked it. My friend invited me to go, and I was hesitant at first because this is somewhere that I knew he would be. But I went. And sure enough, when we passed the restaurant, he was wearing the blue shirt. And instead of seeing him from the corner of my eye like I had on my dream, I looked him in the face. I got so angry and honestly pretty anxious. I just kept walking and forced myself out of the funk. I'll be posting updates if anything more happens. Thank you so much for sharing this journey with me. And thank you for reading, if you did in fact read any of it. This is the deepest story of my heart at this point in my life. So by reading it, you are giving a great piece of me. About a month ago, a man came to my boyfriend's work and asked to speak to him. He asked if my boyfriend was blank, and my boyfriend confirmed and asked who he was slash what he could do for him. He said, I just wanted to meet the guy who was with the girl that I proposed to. My boyfriend, assuming this is a misunderstanding, asks, and who's that? The guy gives my full name. My boyfriend asks his name, so he can tell me he said hello, and the guy gives him a death glare and walks away. Now I'm a thousand percent sure that I do not know who this person is, or at the very least, a hundred percent sure isn't someone that I dated. Only one person has ever proposed to me, and my boyfriend has met that person prior. I went through every person that remotely matched the description, even if it didn't make sense, and my boyfriend said that none of them were him. Today, I confirmed for sure that my dance bag is missing from my car. I only leave my car unlocked at home. If someone was to steal something from my car, there are a lot of tools and things that would be worth stealing. A lot more than my bag of sweaty old shoes and tight leotards. Maybe I somehow forgot to lock my car someplace, and someone stole it because the bag itself is cute. But I really can't imagine I would leave it unlocked like that. Do you think this is paranoia? Or something more? I had a stalker growing up. She lived in my neighborhood with her parents. Note, she's an adult living with her parents, not a child. I used to ride my bike around the neighborhood and would always pass by her house. Every time I passed her house, I would notice that she would come outside and watch me if she wasn't already there. I never thought anything of it because I was young. Her watching me turned into her trying to talk to me, but of course I would ignore her because I didn't know her. Then she would follow me wherever I rode my bike. Now I was getting freaked out. That turned into her following me to my house, asking if she could come in. I eventually stopped riding my bike altogether, so this lady stopped doing what she was doing. I'm 14 now, still living in the same neighborhood. She's back. 
It all started with her coming out to our door and knocking on it. I remembered her and immediately freaked out. Her knocking turned into her banging and violently shaking the doorknob while yelling. She knew our names. She yells, hi, my name, or hi, my mom's name. I have no clue how she knows our names. Neither me nor my mom have ever spoken to her in our lives. The only way she would know our names is if she asked the neighbors that knows us or the landlord, which is super creepy. Why couldn't she have just asked us ourselves? One night, my mom is getting ready to head out to do the laundry at the laundromat near our house. My mom unlocks the door and then goes into the living room where I am. The lady had pushed the door open, came into our house, and started walking into the living room. My mom yelled at her and pushed her out, slamming and locking the door. This must have meant that she was waiting for the door to be unlocked, or waiting for one of us to come outside. Or it could have been a coincidence, but that seems kind of unlikely. My mom left eventually, and as she was walking into the laundromat, the lady was walking behind her, but my mom noticed and slammed the door so she couldn't get in. It was midnight at this point. I was folding the clothes and I hear banging on the door. <laughs> what do you know? Of course it's her again. I check the peephole and I can see her running away, as if she knew that I was there. Now, it's maybe 2 to 3 a.m. I was in the living room again. I hear something moving in the grass behind my house. I check to see what it was and it was the lady. She ran away as she saw me look at her. This has been happening every night since then. I've also been hearing a few people stand in front of our yard, talking to each other quite often late at night, but I'm not sure if this has anything to do with this woman or not. I think this might be happening to our neighbors as well, because I heard them talking about a stalker a couple of times. I remember them saying something along the lines of, Go away, you neighborhood stalker. I have no idea why this started up again. But God, I wish it hadn't. What are the effects of being stalked? Once it happens, how does it affect you? And in what way? I was 16, going about life and trying to score well in tests to go to a college of my choice. He was in the class adjacent to mine. I've never spoken to him. I've only seen him around here or there. When school was about to end, he sent the yearbook through a friend for me to write in. I found it very weird because we have had absolutely no contact, and I refused to write in it, and I told her that I didn't know him, so I wouldn't do it. On the last day of school, while I'm waiting in the parking lot, he and a friend come stand in front of me and start saying things and making hand gestures. I don't say anything, so I just walk away as the car arrived. He then started calling up my aunt. I'd given everyone at school her number and talking to her. It never struck me as excessively odd because she never could remember his name, and she just told me that it was one of my classmates. He was trying to get into a similar college to mine, so they just talked about that. A year later, a friend calls me and tells me that he came to her house asking for information about me. He apparently told her that he liked her so much because she was friends with me. Her dad was at home when it happened, so she told her to inform me. She thought I knew about him, but I didn't. He was apparently also going around my town, looking for me and asking other people about me. She told me about how he followed me home, and that she found this out from someone else, but I had no idea about that either. Then I remember all the times he and I were going in the same direction, his vehicle coming behind mine, but I brushed it off, thinking that it was just because he probably lived nearby. Oh, how very wrong I was. I was 18 and I was coming home for Christmas vacation and saw him on the way to my house. He was with a friend. They were following me. I had to get my passport renewed so I needed to schedule an appointment. For that I went to the office and as I was telling them some personal information, he came in and started to make small talk with one of the men there. I got out after my work was done. His friend and him were on the other side of the road to where my car was parked. I went home but it didn't seem like they were following me then. But really, it doesn't matter, because they already knew where I lived. I checked my phone after I got home, and I had a message from an unknown number, around the time that I was in the office. 
It was him. He introduced himself in it. I immediately blocked him, and he messaged me from another number. The message said that his motive wasn't to mess with me, and that he never talked to me in school or did anything else because of the same. He would delete my number. Everything he had as a reminder of me, and that this message would be his last message, if I thought so. It ended with him saying that he just wanted me to know that he liked me, and I blocked this number as well. I found it very creepy that he had to delete my number and everything that he had as a reminder of me, mostly because I don't know how he got my number, and we've never interacted for him to have things that remind him of me. I thought I saw him just outside my backyard the next day, but I just rushed inside and locked the doors and didn't dare peek out the window. The next few days, I was looking out the window every now and then, making sure that no one was there. I felt unsafe in my own home. I got back to college when I got a call from an unknown number again. Because I'd given my number for official purposes, I don't always know who exactly was calling me, but I still picked up because it could have been important. It was his friend. He said that I had no right to just block him like that, and that I did not know how to respect people. He said the stalker changed after what I had done to him and that I was ruining his life, and that the stalker didn't know that he had called me. He said that he didn't want me to be the reason for the ruin of someone's life, so he was telling me this. In order to undo the damage I had done, I needed to talk to the stalker. He was very demanding and pushy. I refused. I genuinely felt afraid and traumatized by that phone call, so much so that I ran to my friends in tears and told them about it. They told me if it were to happen again, I should just tell them off. For a while, whenever I got phone calls from an unknown number, my heart would start pounding and my hands would start shaking. I was afraid it would be them again. I was 19 when I got a message from an unknown number asking me how my exams were. I don't know how he knew I had exams then. Maybe he had his friends spying on me. I blocked that number as well. I then proceeded to cut off all my school friends because I didn't know who was giving him information about me. I was getting very paranoid, especially when I got a phone call from someone that I knew back then. Of course, I didn't pick up. Then I got random messages from a few numbers that I again blocked. The reason I didn't change my number was because I had given it in a number of places for official purposes and it would be a pain to change it from everywhere. I still don't know if he has people spying on me. And I don't know if he is gone for good, but I still feel unsafe at sometimes, and afraid. No one should have to go through things like this just because someone doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. Getting obsessed with someone to the point of threatening them with your life is downright horrifying. In this country, in this age, I am unable to voice my concerns because they ask me, why did you talk to him? Why did you give your phone number to him? Would you believe me if I said that I did no such thing? It started four years ago, a Facebook friend of mine, purely because he seemed to have attended my school and graduated two years before me, was Facebook messaging me. To be friendly, I responded politely, general Q&A. What are you studying? Which university are you attending? I was doing a distance course from my comforts of my home. I can swear that I never gave my personal number out, but I have always had the same number since the day that I turned 16. It could be common knowledge from mutual school friends. Two years ago, he called me from a US-based number. I live in Asia. He talked to me for about two minutes, mentioned that he would like to meet me if he came back home. Being the girl that was called ugly her whole life, I never conceived that boys slash men could be interested in me in any other way than just a friendship. I said, oh yeah, sure, out of pure courtesy, and had no intention of following through with the meeting. Last year, he called again, from a different number and said the same thing. We'll be visiting next month. Let's catch up. Me. Oh, I don't live in our hometown anymore. I've moved elsewhere for my job. Him. You can allocate one weekend for me. Me. Haha. <laughs> Let's see, I'm out right now, so bye. No contact after that for the rest of the year. Fifteen days ago, 
May 6, 2018. I received a call from an unknown local number. I was expecting a parcel delivery and thinking it was the Amazon delivery executive, so I answered the call. It was him. I didn't realize it right away, though I had suspicion because of his distinctive, creepy, childlike voice. He's 26 plus years old. He would not cut the call. He called me Sweetie, Princess, Honey Bun. Nicknames that give me goosebumps because honestly, even my boyfriend does not call me those things. It's just not my thing. I repeatedly tried to be nice and cut the call, saying I had prior commitments, and he kept asking to meet me. Although he never specifically said, would you like to go out with me? Because that, I can answer by saying no, I have a boyfriend. I'm the kind of person who does not believe in using the boyfriend term as a throwaway threat. If a person does not respect my wish to be left alone, they do not deserve to have a place anywhere near me. After I specifically told him five times that we are friends and nothing more, he said, yes, yes, we are friends. Of course we are friends. Him. Can I call you later? Me. I'm really busy. We'll see. Him. Do you want me to call you later? Me. I guess I don't mind. Him. You don't mind? Or you want to talk to me? Me. Whichever way you want to take it, I really don't care. And then I kind of threw a fake laugh in there. Him. I'll take it the sweeter way. Do you want things to be sweeter? In literally the most saccharine, disgusting tone that you can possibly imagine. Me. What is that supposed to mean? Please stop being vague and subtle. Whatever it is you want, just be direct. After a few more minutes of behaving oddly, I had to cut him off halfway when he kept insisting that I meet him. A few hours later, I got a call from yet another number, which I answered as I was expecting an official client call around this time. He was acting so weird. Did you block me, baby? I really want to talk to you. Understand the feelings behind my words. I cut him off yet again and called a girlfriend for advice as this was beginning to get creepy. She suggested that I pick up the next call and tell him I'm not interested and I have a boyfriend. During my call with her, he called me at least five times. After telling him that I have a boyfriend, he says, I want a sweet friendship. Your love and affection. I want to be a constant in your life. During the entire duration of the call, he accused me of thinking badly of him by saying so blatantly that I had a boyfriend, all while calling me Sweetie, Baby, and other regional pet names that people don't even call their own children. It was in full creep territory. Bear in mind, this is an acquaintance that I have spoken to for an overall two minutes and have never met. I put him out of my mind and attended my official call, at which he calls me 15 times. The call was on wait, and normal sane humans don't call 15 times in the duration of an hour. The next morning, I woke up to 12 more missed calls. I texted him in the most polite way, knowing I am dealing with a probably psychopath. Me. Hi. While I appreciate that you consider and call me occasionally, I'm not comfortable with it. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, but we are not really friends, so I doubt it would be a major problem to end things here. All the best for your business, and congrats on the new car. He asked me for advice when he had called the first time. Take care. Bye. Him. I'm sorry if I made you feel bad. Calling you occasionally is not my intention. I wish to be a constant and be there in your life. Kindly consider once more before taking this decision. Please give me a chance. Take care. Me. I understand, but I am not comfortable. You cannot force a person to be your friend. I'm sure you're a nice person, but I am not comfortable with your vague insinuations and nicknames. Yes, I admit I am being cautious, but I don't know anything about you except your name. At this point, I don't want to know much more. I have a lot on my plate and cannot deal with this vagueness and drama. I want to be as direct as possible to avoid misunderstandings in the future. Him. I completely understand, and I was not being dramatic. I just want to be real to you. I'm sorry to push you to such an extreme. I will really miss you. Take care. God bless. If you need me, reach out anytime. I blocked all his numbers and moved on to bigger problems. I even forgot his existence. 
Yesterday, I received a call from a vague four-digit number. For the record, I do not use any social media apps like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or WhatsApp. I have tons to do, and I find them distracting. Although I have a WhatsApp account, I'm not active on it for the last month and a half. The other sites, I don't even have an account. My boyfriend is abroad on vacation, and thinking he was calling me, I answered the phone and heard Mr. Psycho's voice. Hello? Are you online? I pretended my network was weak and said, Hello? Hello? About six times and ended the call. Immediately after, my junior from office called for clarifications. Over that ten-minute discussion, Psycho called me eight times from various three- and four-digit numbers, which I now know is due to voice over IP, and I let it ring until it got cut. I was already creeped out by this, and called a few friends to let them know the situation had escalated. I couldn't sleep last night, probably due to overthinking things. I figured I'd get a glass of water around 1 a.m. My dog was whining away at the gate, and I figured that I'd check up on him. We have a gated compound, and my dog likes to stay outside the house in the compound during the nights. As I inserted the key and unlocked the main door, a car passed by on the road. Through the glass panel, by the door, I saw the headlights illuminate the figure of a short human standing right outside the gates. Wide stance and seemed to be facing my door. Although the lights inside my house were off, I was scared to have been spotted. I wondered again why my dog wasn't barking his head off, just whining. I saw him walk around the short driveway very slowly, almost as if he was drugged. I could hear my heartbeat quicken as I ensured all the latches were fastened. All the windows are protected by metal grills, and the window panes cannot be opened from the outside. I tossed and turned all night, scared for my family, my aging grandparents, and my sick father. I kept walking to the first floor windows to see if he was still there. There were no cars on the road, and I couldn't see anything, but I had a feeling he was still there. This morning, my dog was still woozy, but otherwise unharmed. He had a muddy print around his neck. It looked like a hand. I'm not paranoid. I bathed him two days ago. He was clean as a whistle. Nobody walks around with muddy red soil on their hands. Do they? I have not spoken to my parents, yet primarily due to my father's recent heart condition. I should call the cops. I suppose... I have been stalked for a little over 10 years. Obviously, the time frame of this makes it nearly impossible to share the full story, so I'll give some highlights. And in case you're wondering, not a ton of people in my life know about this, and I thought it would be a good way to air out some of my frustrations. I met this guy when I was 17. He came to a party I had thrown at my house and was invited by a friend of a friend. Looking back now, he could probably be classified as a nice guy, wore fedoras, owned more swords than clean shirts, and told everyone he was a vampire. He also said that he was from Ireland, even though his accent was garbage. However, he seemed harmless enough. At this point, he was probably 23 or so. Party was going fine until he tried to kiss me, even though my boyfriend at the time was there and he knew that. He got drunk and crawled into my neighbor's car. His friends took him home and I figured I would never see him again. Two days later, he popped up on MySpace. Once again, I thought he was harmless and I added him. He immediately starts messaging me, saying how much he likes me, he thinks I'm beautiful, etc. I thanked him, but I reminded him that I had a boyfriend and I wasn't interested in anything romantic. I thought he got the picture. Three months later, I'm off to college. My boyfriend and I broke up since I moved 14 plus hours away and it just wasn't working. I get a message, on Facebook this time, from said guy. He saw my relationship status had changed and wanted to see if I was doing okay. I didn't respond. Flash forward a year later in college turns out, it's not for me. I move back home, slightly defeated and resume life as normal. I'm now hanging out with all my hometown besties, living life as normal, and we decided to throw another party. By the way, my father was recently divorced and working for the military so he was gone for a couple of weeks at a time, in case you're wondering how an 18-year-old is throwing so many parties. But guess who shows up? 
Yep. Well, at this point, I'm depressed about college and drunk, so I'm chatting Irish vampire up. He starts telling me how excited he is that I'm back and blah blah. I'm just mostly ignoring him. However, that night, my friend made a grave error. She sees me talking to him, so figured it was okay to give him my number. Two days go by, and this guy has already texted me about 50 times. Called several times, as well as sent pictures of his blade collection. All within me going to sleep. I promptly blocked his number and told slash sewed said friend everything. At this point, he then messaged me on Facebook a ton of times, and I blocked him on there as well. Remember that he had been to my house, so he knows where I live. And a couple days later, after the whole blocking thing, he shows up with flowers, telling me that he's sorry, and that he loves me, and that we're meant to be together. Thankfully, my dad was home and scared him off. After this, I started seeing his car everywhere I went. I felt like everything I was doing was being monitored. I decided that it would be better to go live with my mom in another state. My dad and I weren't getting along, and a lot of my friends were moving, so I felt no reason to stay. At this point, I'm 20. I moved, and everything is cool for about a year, until I get a package in the mail from Irish Vamp. I had no idea, still to this day, how he got my address. He starts sending me gifts and letters. Then, he gets my new number and starts texting and calling me all over again. The messages started getting cryptic, like, You can never escape me. I'll always find you. He figured out my work and school schedule. I went back and would call every time that I had a break. I finally told my mom and she pushed me to getting a restraining order. But since he lived in a different state, it proved rather hard. This goes on and on for years. Two years ago, I didn't hear anything from him. By the way, I'm happily married and in a happy relationship for almost six years now. And yes, my husband does know about everything. I thought, oh, he finally got the picture and is leaving me alone. No. He was in jail for beating the absolute out of his ex, trying to run her over with his car, and then crashing said car while intoxicated. He was meant to be locked up for eight years, but he got out in two. As soon as he was released, he started all over again, got my number, and has been messaging me nonstop. I hope one day there will be a happy end to this, but for now have to leave it as a cliffhanger because it's still going on and it doesn't show any signs of slowing down. Hi there. I couldn't find a better word to convey what I'm feeling right now other than crazy. Although... It's a very stigmatizing word. I had an abusive ex for three years. Multiple domestic violence convictions, whatever. I left him ten years ago. Throughout time, he has sporadically reached out. To which, for the most part, I am cordial. Don't ask why, I just was. A part of it was because I cared. Trauma bonding. And the other part, because I wanted to be on good terms for my safety. More recently, two years ago... I blocked him. That's when I really started to become suspicious. I didn't know blocked people could still leave voicemails until I cleaned my mailbox and discovered a blocked messages file. He began leaving voicemails saying things like, I'm sitting outside of your mom's house thinking of you. 3 a.m. 2. I'm sitting outside our high school remembering things and I'm leaving for London tomorrow and I need to see you tonight. He never left. Shortly after, I saw him at Walmart. I was shopping for items for grad school when I felt a hand on my shoulder and a shiver down my spine. I turned around to find him. I'm moving to LA, he said. That's nice, I replied, thinking that he was bragging. You know, he quipped. I joined a fraternity, got my degree in psychology. I'm moving to LA. I'm living the life that you wanted to live. Annoyingly, I replied, Okay. You know I do all this for you, he said. Shortly after that, I bumped into him at the mall. Weird, I thought, as my then partner asked if he has a tracker on me. I wondered. Nah, I rationalized. 
San Diego was smallish. We're bound to run into one another every once in a while. Then, I saw his best, straight, gal pal at a gay bar that I've never seen her at before. The same night that I saw her on, the next week he's there perusing the bar. Which is interesting, because he hated gay people when we were together. I confronted him via text, which was probably satisfying to him. People change, he reasoned. The kicker to that night was that my ex reported seeing him there, appearing to look for me. I, at the last minute, opted out of going to the bar to catch up with a friend who was shortly after murdered by her fiancé. Chills. Then, he started working at the job I worked at before I quit for grad school. Began commenting on my blogs, which I didn't know it was him until recently. He now has been reaching out repetitively to apologize for what he's done, as he's going to therapy, he says. What are you apologizing for exactly? I asked, wanting him to verbalize the abuse. It was a moment I thought I could stand up for myself, because I didn't before. My game addiction, he said. I corrected him, and told him that he abused me. Then, randomly, as I'm leaving my domestic violence advocacy training, oh the irony, he texts me. I forgive you. I know now that he probably wanted to get a reaction out of me, but it worked. For what? I asked, to which he responded, for the lies. I then asked, how could I ever feel comfortable telling the truth to someone who beat me over simple things? He went on to try to say that my fiancé had been calling him from my phone and cursing him out. Really? I had to call to hear this lie for myself. Little did he know, my fiancé and I separated six months prior, so there was no way that could happen. His response, he stumbled, but then went on to say, Well, now I'm really concerned, implying that my ex-fiancé may have hacked my phone. It was a trap. I feel stupid. Now he knows I'm single. He then began confessing his love for me, mentioning me having a dog. How did you know that? I asked. He explained he doesn't have any social media, so how did he know that? He changed the subject. The only thing is, I'm not naive to these tactics anymore. He asked where I lived, only to show restraint in saying that's too personal, and then asked again anyways. Too personal, I replied. He then asked me to help him learn how to have boundaries, as I have such good ones. The next day he messaged me. This is the last time I ever want to talk to you again. It's toxic. Bye. I am appalled and feel dumb for even engaging with this person and subjecting myself to these manipulations. I may be stronger and more knowledgeable, but it still took a toll on my mental health. Now I'm wondering, am I crazy? Am I overthinking this? I've thought about this all day, and how to write it up in a way that would express the true emotion behind it. But here it goes. Last night, I had an appointment at 7 to give a speech, and was on my way wearing heels and a dress. I pulled up to a traffic light with a four-way stop. Straight ahead was a mobile home park. To the left was Trader Joe's, and to the right, another mobile home park. As I sat at the stoplight, I noticed a girl wearing a long black sweatshirt and shorts. She was running at full speed out of the mobile home park in front of me. Behind her was a man, twice her age in a green windbreaker, shorts, a scruffy beard, and a mountain bike, following within five to ten feet of her. I initially thought it was her dad, keep an eye on her while she jogged. How wrong I was. Suddenly, her run turned into an all-out sprint up the street to the right, headed towards the second mobile home park. She kept looking behind her frantically running even faster. I watched the stalker pause at the stoplight for a moment, just watching her as she walked up the street. I felt like I had just witnessed his inner monologue that told him to continue to go after her. He picked his bike up in one swoop and turned it in the direction she'd run. At this point, I'd flipped my car around and was ready to take this guy out. I suddenly see the girl run into the second mobile home park 
and was worried she was probably running home and he'd know where she lived. My heart sank, but right as she began running up her row to her mobile unit, the guy comes flying around the corner and cuts her off on his bike, forcing her to turn and run back to the street. At this point, I pulled up into the turn lane to the mobile park, as did another man. I could see the biker was still on a mission to get this girl, and he had no plans of moving on, despite all the attention. Since the person in the turn lane in front of me got out to help, I had nowhere to go and threw my hazards on. The man in the van ran over to me and asked what he should do. I told him to call 911. Then I went to work on the stalker guy. I told the girl to stay right next to me because I didn't want him to see where she lived. He was 10 feet away now at a bus stop, riding in figure eights, pretending he hadn't done anything wrong. You need to leave now. Do you understand me? I said. Him. I didn't do anything. Me. Looking at the girl. Do you know this man? The girl. No. Me. Is he chasing you? Girl. Yes. Me. Do not look at her. You need to leave now. The police have been called and we have video and photos of you. Man. Takes off, almost swerving in front of a car with his bike. Me. I yell at him to pay attention to traffic and move on. I wait until he's long gone and then turn to the girl. Me. This is extremely serious. He was actually following you. You need to go home and stay home tonight. During this time, more than three people stopped to help this girl. It was so apparent that things were about to go wrong that I'm proud to say multiple citizens stepped up to help. I wish I could give people this advice, both men and women. When you feel you're being followed, turn your phone slash video on if possible and face it towards the person. Hold your hand straight out and say firmly, stop following me. Most people will back off if they didn't know they were too close for comfort and will gladly apologize and offer for you to go ahead. But the bad ones will curse you out and make excuses. Get them on video if you can. If you're more comfortable without the camera, put your hand up and say the above. Don't be afraid to do this. They are either going to apologize or run away. Go with your gut and stay safe. Hey everyone, I do not want to overreact, so I'm looking for advice. I received a text from an unknown, although local to my current temporary residence, phone number. For the purposes of this story, let's say my name is Sally. The text said, Hey, hey, Sally. What's up, baby girl? I was put off, because I do not know any man with that area code, let alone one who would text me like that. I texted my friend a screenshot, and then asked him who he was. She called him. Maybe ten minutes later but he did not pick up. I blocked the number. It's important to mention that in December of 2018, the police were called to my residence while I was asleep. A man was trying to get into my apartment, but my neighbor and roommate would not let him pass because he was aggressive. I slept through it. My roommate knew the people in my circle, and she knew that he was not in it. The police woke me up around 3 a.m. and asked me if I knew him. I was honestly still very much asleep, but confirmed to myself, I really had no idea who the guy was, and the officer that I didn't know him. They had a verbal argument outside my apartment afterwards. Today, my maintenance man, my blinds were broke so he came over to fix them, asked me if I had anyone throwing things at my window at night. I said no. He said that he asked because my neighbor had complained of that to the police and property management. I've not heard it myself but sometimes you sleep through things. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper. Anyway, I know that this is not illegal, and I do not have much trust in the police here. What do I do? Side note. In the past, I have had received anonymous gifts and detailed anonymous messages online.
I'm going to start off by saying that I wasn't the perfect person, and I have made mistakes. I had this really great friend for almost four to five years, and I knew he had a crush on me during high school and after. We remained friends after graduation, even became best friends. I was attracted to him, but it wasn't the right time in my life for a serious relationship. So I never let him on, and always let him know our friendship was everything to me. After a year or two, I changed. I became a better person. I liked who I saw in the mirror, and I felt as if I was ready for a relationship with him. So I made my move, and we got together in a couple months. In the beginning, I was so happy to be with him. He was my best friend, of course. I thought everything would be perfect. We know how each other were. But I guess I never really knew him, because he would get mad pretty easily. And when he got mad, there wasn't anything I could do to calm him down. I always used to try to talk things through. It wasn't us versus each other. It was us versus the problem that we were trying to overcome. But he would get handsy, start shoving me or pushing me off of him. There were so many times he would twist my arm and tell me that I was nothing to him. He even said that he only got with me to tell everyone we had sex, since I was everyone's crush in high school. But for some reason I stayed. I stayed because I thought maybe that I pushed him to this. He wasn't like this before. Maybe I'm just not trying hard enough to fix us. Maybe I haven't changed enough. We stayed together for a year and a couple of months. He would talk to other girls and eventually I started talking to guys too. I never deleted my messages because at some point I just didn't care anymore. But neither one of us could walk away. This was the ideal relationship. The dorky friend finally getting with his high school crush. He was the nice guy that finally got the girl. In the last couple of months, I started to talk to an ex of mine. Let's call him A. It was just catching up and that we wanted to hang out soon one day. I noticed something was off, and I felt like I should talk to him, even if my ex-boyfriend didn't want me to. One day after a friend's birthday, we were all drinking. My ex thought that I was flirting with guys and conveniently found my messages with A. So he told me we were leaving and took me back to his place. He dragged me out of the car and started punching me. He sat on my chest and just kept slamming his fist to my face. I screamed and screamed, but no one came. I begged him to let me go. I wouldn't tell anyone just to let me go home. But he didn't. My screams fell on deaf ears. Then he dragged me by my hair into his house. The night became a blur after I got into the house. I woke up the next day in his bed. He had sex with me when I was unconscious. Then he dropped me off at my house and left. The following weeks, I would drink to get my mind off of things. I was going to drunk call A and just cry and tell him everything. But I didn't, because I didn't want to worry him. The following day, I was with friends when someone told me that A died. They said that he had killed himself, and I was broken. I wanted to see him and talk to him, but it was too late. My ex reached out to me and told me that he wanted to talk, and I stupidly accepted. We talked in a park in front of people, but he started sobbing, so he went to the car at the park. He told me I had to talk to him or else he would kill himself, and it would be my fault, so I accepted. Fast forward two months, and he's going crazy finding out that I hung out with a guy and comes to my house screaming at me. I told him to leave, and I never wanted to see him again. The following weeks, I noticed on my Snapchat and Instagram some messages were being read and deleted. At first, I thought I was doing that when I was drunk. I also noticed on my Facebook some messages were deleted as well. If you go on Facebook, it'll show you where you log into, so I decided to check. What I saw scared the hell out of me. There were so many logins at my ex's house, my house, and where I worked. And I don't use Facebook that much. And it conveniently happens that my Instagram and Facebook were connected. My ex had been stalking me for months, and I never knew it. New Year's Day, my ex posted a naked photo of me on the profile before I knew he had access to my accounts. It was up for five minutes, and he took it down. He told everyone that he was sorry and drunk. I went to the cops, and they told me it could be me doing that trying to set him up. But I don't have an Android. I have an iPhone, 
and it shows what type of phone logs in onto Facebook. I've deleted all my accounts and stopped talking to people. The cops are no help at all, and haven't even arrested him for the assault charges. And the last thing he did that makes him even more disgusting is he made a fake account, using a family member's name, knowing that I would accept it. Also, he called me one day, saying when he picked me up from a party, he had sex with me while I was passed out, and this happened two years before we got together. I hate him. He's a disgusting person, and I hope to God that he stops stalking me. I can't share this with my Facebook friends because he keeps figuring out how to bypass my block settings. So I'm here because I have to vent to someone and he hasn't discovered this account yet. I was doing some online dating in 2014, chatting with this guy for weeks, then drove all night after work to spend a couple of days blowing off steam away from the stress of work and life. I was young and naive. I believed almost anything that I was told. And boy, did he have some stories to tell. I guess I wanted to believe him, even though I should have known nothing he said was real. I guess even if I had known, I wouldn't have cared. I was at a vulnerable point in my life, and I just needed someone to be close to. He saw that and took advantage. To make a long story short, we finally met in person, spent the night together, and I went back home. He later claimed to have been disgusted with my appearance because any girl who works all day then drives all night should look like a model on a runway. And that must have been what spurred his decision to tell me that it would never work out. I, wanting to stubbornly see things through, convinced him that it was too early to make that decision and waste the weeks of conversations up to that point. And we kept our long-distance conversations going for a while longer. Eventually, I started to see the cracks in his story, see the shadow of his true nature, and agreed that we weren't right for each other. But he saw things differently. At first, he accused me of being a liar, a slut, a whore, still into my ex, and that's why I didn't want him. A switch flipped, and he showed me his crazy side. I blocked his number, ignored his emails, took him off of my Facebook, but he still managed to get to me. For every account that I blocked, he made three more. I started dating a guy where I was, but I moved in with a friend for a few months to help with the renovation, closer to where the crazy lived than I was before. Ended up filing a police report of stalking and harassment. By that time, he had started posting lies about me online, on blog sites and cheater sites, about me and pretending to be me, and I didn't feel safe. I moved back to where my boyfriend lived, an all-night drive that he helped me with just happy to have me home again. I was happy to be home, and I finally felt safe again, for a while. But crazy never stopped. The harassment continued. The posts kept coming. He tried contacting me, and even went so far as to post my information online. My phone number, address, social media, work, vehicle info, etc., he offered to pay for more information on me, and pressed for violence against me. He slandered my name all over, and I had to stop my occasional freelance modeling because of it. I had to ask photographers to remove me from their online portfolios, so he wouldn't plaster my body all over these sites devoted to tearing down exes. My boyfriend could have believed the lies, but have hated me for what crazy was trying to put us through. But he didn't. He got protective helped me compile a two-inch binder full of the accounts of the slander, harassment, and threats. And with guidance from a lawyer that I met at karaoke, we filed another police report and tried to get a protective order. Unfortunately for me, I was being stalked by a professional. He knew how to cover his tracks, use various aliases, leave threats just veiled enough to not be legally considered threatening. He also lived four states away, and although it would be less than a two-hour flight, he had already mentioned my address and what he thought someone should do to me. The judge didn't think that this was close enough to be a threat and denied the protective order. I watched the slander sites for a while, 
got contacted by his apologetic sister and some other exes in a group devoted to stopping the constant abuse we all faced. It only hurt me more to know how badly I'd been lied to. And eventually, I just stopped keeping track and ignored it all, hoping it would go away. For the most part, it did stop. For a while, at least. And after a year or so of seeing my name and face dragged through the dirt, I didn't fight back. So he got nothing from trying to hurt me. I stayed friends with one of the girls from that group, changed my number a few times, made new social media accounts, and he found a few of them. But I blocked and ignored it all. After a while, there was nothing. Fast forward to last fall, and I'm still with the same man who held me through the mess before, with a wedding dress in the car and the last of our recently packed belongings, moving to a new state for a fresh start. I didn't see it until yesterday, but Crazy tried to reach out again when we moved. A notification popped up on my phone that a cousin sent a message on Facebook, but when I opened the app, it showed an ignored message from someone not in my contacts. From him. It's been four years, but he's back at it. A quick Google search showed that he'd been posting more stuff about me recently, though not as much as before, all pretending to be me or someone else, then himself again, to look like the victim. It's hard to believe. But then, really, it isn't that believable. He's done it before, to me and to others, and it should be no shock. I just wonder how much he knows about my new life, or if I should be worried. I wonder if I'll ever be free of his harassment, even though I'll never be free of the awful memories. I wonder if I'll need to use that revolver sitting in my nightstand one day to protect myself. I wonder if one day, someone else will get tired of his shit and do it for me. I wonder, will I ever be truly safe again? I wanted to share my story of when I was 18 years old. I was working at my first ever job as a cashier. I had been there almost six months and was really hoping for a promotion sometime soon. We were a resale shop, so as long as I had another cashier working, I helped out my other co-workers with stocking and cleaning. When I was on the floor, a customer approached me. Nothing odd at first. Usually, people just ask for help. That's what I'm here for. He comes up and goes, Hi, Jennifer. Not my real name, but I thought I'd put it there. Hi, can I help you? Do you remember me? I bought those cups last week. No, I didn't actually remember him, but I wanted to be polite. And silly me thought, he's just an old man. What's the worst he could do? Sure, I hope you're enjoying them. Is there anything you're trying to find? He shakes his head no and just kind of stands there. Okay, well, if you need anything, let me know. So I start to walk away, but he starts walking behind me. Not far behind me, either. He was so close that I could feel his body heat. After a minute of this, I turned and said, Are you sure there isn't something you need? He pulls out a little slip of paper that looks like it'd fit inside a fortune cookie and sets it on the shelf and slides it to me. Do you have a boyfriend? Surprised and shocked, I said no. I had a girlfriend, but didn't think to say it because of how surprised I was. Well, let me take you fishing sometime. And the paper had his name on it. Kevin. Alongside of his phone number. Take it, he said. So I did, and ran into the employee back of the store and told my manager immediately. He concluded that he probably wouldn't come back because I wasn't going to call him. We were wrong. He came back and tried to give me his phone number multiple times. Each time I saw him, I spoke to him less and less, or went into the employees' only rooms. All of my managers were very supportive, except one who thought that I was overreacting. When I told him about him continuing to come back, continuing to ask me out, and continuing to give me his phone number, he would say stuff like, he's a regular, or he just wants his senior discounts, despite the fact that he would only bust his shift at my register. I came off my lunch break once, and... He had just finished being checked out, and was almost at the door when he saw me. He had a line wrapping around the store, and he stood next to my register for an hour, staring at me until all the other customers went away. He stood there and pulled out his number yet again. I was so stressed, I just screamed. 
stop giving me your number. You're too old to be doing this. I broke down and he ran out of the store. I was tired of him waiting, always asking. He had started going into the employees only parts of the store, and my co-workers who closed said that he had waited for me more than once in the parking lot and wrote down his plate numbers. After I screamed and broke down, I thought he finally went away. He had shown up every day for two weeks before then, but when I screamed at him, he stopped coming by for a week. The night he came back, my heart sunk into my chest. When he came to my register to check out, he said, I gave you some space. I've noticed, I replied. After some silence, he pulls out his wallet. Are you sure you don't want to go out with me? Yes. So he bought his things and put his wallet back in his pocket. Then he paused and said he wanted to buy something else. So I ring him up and this time he pulls out a pocket knife and puts it on the counter. He looks at me and says, Now, are you sure you don't want to go out with me? Scared, I take a step away and say, Yes, I am sure. He sighed and pulled out his wallet, paid, put it away, and the knife, then stomps out of the store. I had a complete and total panic attack. During the confrontation, a co-worker who saw but didn't like me pointed and laughed when I mouthed help. I stormed back there and screamed. He had a knife. He had a knife. I had to get calmed down as I yelled at her about how I could have been seriously hurt. I turned to my manager, tell him about what just happened, and then as soon as I got off, I called my mom and went straight to the sheriff's station. We filed a report about what happened that night and everything leading up to it. After a few days, I found out that they went down to where he lived and gave him a firm warning to stop. I was sad they didn't arrest him, but he did stop. They had to drive three towns over because his current living address was 40 minutes away. He had been making daily trips to me. Also, his wife was very unhappy to find out what he was doing. That's right. He was married on top of all of that. I ended up quitting shortly after, scared that he would come back. But I was happy that it had all been finally taken care of. That's about it, though. Scary and kind of long, but I hope you find my rather traumatizing story at least a little bit interesting. I am a 25-year-old female, and have been living in Japan for a few years now. And one thing I have quite often are stalker encounters. It seems that in my area, or anywhere that isn't a big city now that I think about it, Japanese men can come quite obsessed with foreign women, especially fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed foreign women such as myself. I've dealt with quite a few situations where I was sure that I would be kidnapped. One such encounter was back in 2013 when I was in my third year of university. The following was a very brief encounter, but a terrifying one nonetheless. I was studying abroad at a school in Saitama, making a lot of friends and having the time of my life. I joined the a cappella club and had a group that I sang with. Together there were five of us. They were all men, which made me uncomfortable at first, but we blended well together, and they felt more comfortable singing English songs with me there to help with pronunciation and whatnot. One day after practice was finished, my group invited me to go shopping with them at a local supermarket to get things for a nabe party. For those who don't know, nabe is basically a hot spot. You get a bunch of veggies and some meat, then you put a big pot on a little portable gas burner and everyone gathers around and eats together. It's a huge part of Japanese culture and a great way to hang out with friends. I was ecstatic that they invited me. I was usually left out of these things at first because I was an outsider whereas they had known each other since their freshman year. Over the few months that we have been seeing together, though, they had grown to be like family to me, each one like an overprotective big brother, especially a guy named Kasuke. He was tall and a bit on the heavy side, but he was extremely charismatic. Whenever he saw me fumbling around, nervous or confused, he'd quickly appear by my side and throw a heavy arm around my shoulder, practically knocking me over while asking, What's the problem, Tani-chan? Anyway, the Nabe party. We all went to our friend's house for the party and ended up drinking and talking until pretty late. 
when my phone in my pocket vibrated to tell me that I had low battery, I finally saw the time and realized it was already 4 a.m. The guys were getting ready to nap until the train started back up, but I was only a 30-minute walk away from my share house. I announced that I was leaving and started packing up my stuff. Kosuke offered to walk me home, but I told him I was fine. The sun would be rising soon. Japan has an early sunrise, and it really wasn't that far. The cold would kill me before the walk did, I joked. They reluctantly agreed and saw me off, demanding I call them if anything happened. I made it to the station safely, marking the halfway point home. I descended the stairs to see a single car parked outside, with a man leaning up against it, staring straight at me. It wasn't anyone I knew. He was older than me, in his mid-thirties, maybe early forties. His head turned, watching me as I walked down the stairs. Feeling uncomfortable with the unwanted attention, I rushed my pace a little, grabbing my hands together to fight the sudden chill that overcame me, though I was pretty sure I had nothing to do with the cold. I crossed to the other side of the street, avoiding him as best as I could. I avoided looking at him as well, but I heard the car door slam and the engine start up. Headlights illuminated me, and he turned to drive alongside where I was walking. His window rolled down. Hey, he said in Japanese, are you alone? I said nothing. Where are you going? Do you speak Japanese? I quickened my pace. You're pretty. Let's hang out. I began power walking. The sluggish tiredness from the party was quickly being replaced with adrenaline. He pulled ahead and I thought he gave up, but his car stopped not far ahead and he put it in park, getting out. Let's go home together. He was standing about 10 feet ahead of me. I stopped, so I wasn't walking closer to him. Let's go home together, he repeated a little more forcefully stepping towards me. Get in my car. I didn't have much time to think. I immediately turned left and sprinted into the park. There were only four entrances, all of which a car could not enter. It was a traditional Japanese-style garden with tall bamboo trees and a pond of koi surrounding a gazebo in the middle. The man was in a no-parking zone, so he wouldn't leave his car alone. I heard him curse under his breath and jump back into the car. I pulled out my phone, immediately calling Kosuke. Just my luck, though, he didn't answer. I tried the rest of my group. No one answered. I looked at the next exit, just in time to see his car crawl by slowly, his head sticking out the window, searching for me as I hid behind a grove of bamboo. Trembling in fear, I tried again and again with no success of reaching the guys. I looked repeatedly at my four exits, always seeing him crawl by. He was circling the park, waiting for me to walk out so he could talk to me again, though I had a feeling talking wasn't really what he wanted to do. Just as I was about to cry, my phone lit up dimly with a phone call from Kosuke. What's the problem, Tani-chan? He said jokingly. The other guys in the background were still joking around. In a rush of breath, I explained to him my current predicament. Though he didn't say a word the entire time, I could practically hear the smile leave his face. The rest of the group had quieted too, and I heard one say, What's going on? Is she okay? He told me to stay where I was and that he was on his way, but I was already 20 minutes away and I wasn't sure that I had 20 minutes before the guy parked his car and came into the park to look for me. I looked behind me again, just in time to see him drive by that exit slowly, looking through. That's it. I'm cold. I'm tired. I'm scared, and I want to go home. I'm going to run after he passes the next exit and turns the corner, I explained. No, he said. Wait for me. I can run and be there soon. But Kosuke wasn't a runner. I didn't think he could get there any faster than I could. He started to say something more, but my phone suddenly went dark. Dead battery. No turning back now. I waited a few seconds and there he was, right on schedule. He crawled by the exit then stopped. My heart was pounding so hard I was sure he could hear it, but he looked hard and slowly turned around. The sun was starting to come up now and he had a better view. It was really now or never. He slowly moved forward. I crept out of my hiding spot and moved towards the exit. I poked my head out and saw him turn the corner. I sprinted towards my house and didn't look back. I was too scared to. I don't know if he saw me, and I was too fast to follow or what, but I didn't ever see that guy again. I immediately put my phone on the charger and called the guys back to let them know that I was okay. But Kosuke never let me walk home alone in the dark ever again.
I am a 19 year old female from the UK. Me and my friend have been harassed by this girl that used to be my friend for around a year. A little backstory. This girl and I, let's call her Jane, met when we were in primary school, when we were around 10. As we grew older, I realized that she had some problems. She got into trouble a lot, and we lost contact as we left primary school and entered secondary school. It wasn't until college that we got back into contact. I straight up knew then that this girl had serious behavioral issues. She would tell me she would get into arguments with her mother and ask to stay at my place. She would constantly ask for me to stay at hers. When we were out in public, she would shout offensive things to other people, which was understandably embarrassing for me. Years went on, and now I'm 19, and she only got worse. She would begin to lie to get attention, and lie about the most horrible and disgusting things which I would believe, until I obviously found out from her mother that she was a liar. For example, she said she was pregnant. And when she was asked for proof by friends and family, she would then say that she had a miscarriage. She once lied about her ex-boyfriend assaulting her, but then when asked to report it to the police, she said that she didn't need to because it never happened. Things like that. It was horrible, and I didn't want to associate with her anymore. Not long before I blocked her out of my life, she became possessive and nasty towards me. If I didn't want to meet up, she would try to guilt trip me into meeting her. If I said I was meeting other friends, she would get jealous and get nasty. She would also make things up in her head that I apparently had said to her. For example, it was my dad's birthday in March. She lives nearby. I get a message when I'm with him saying, can I meet you? I said no, I'm with my dad for his birthday and it would be rude to just leave. She then said, you promised you would meet me, which I never did say that at all. She said, Yes, you did. Why would you lie to me? And I said I can never lie about something I never said. She said I wasn't being a good friend, and said to come outside and stop acting like this. She would ring me nearly ten times in a row if I didn't reply, and I just about had enough. So I blocked her. I blocked her on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And that was that for around a week. I got another friend request from another account under her name. I denied and blocked. I then received another a few days later, along with a message saying hi. I blocked that account too. A week later, I checked my Facebook and had a notification saying, Jane like your photo. I clicked it and obviously it was her, but she didn't add me on this one this time, so I blocked her before she could. I got another two friend requests after that and a few messages saying hello and add me back. Why aren't you speaking to me? I blocked that account and then she went on to Instagram. She made three new accounts trying to message me and followed my account liking pictures of my boyfriend and I. She then began following him, even though she hasn't even met him or she's never spoke to him once. She finally tried to add me on Snapchat, which I obviously declined. The final straw was when she went into a social club where my father normally goes with his friends, asking him where I was and why I wasn't speaking to her and asking if I was there with him. This totally freaked me out. This was only a week ago, and I pray to God that she gives up soon. So this happened three months ago. I was out hiking with my friend. I'm not gonna disclaim her real name for privacy, so let's call her Amy. Anyway, me and Amy set off on our travels at 6 a.m. We traveled by public transport. We got the 635 bus to our destination. The bus stop was empty for the first 10 minutes or so, then a man joined. He was looking at the same timetable as us, so we knew he was getting on the same bus. He sat on the bench opposite us and started reading a book. I felt strange as in I knew something was up. I glanced at the man and he would catch my glare and just stare. It wasn't a normal stare, it was a sinister stare. I pulled out my phone and texted Amy to check it out. I didn't want to speak out loud so that he knew that I was talking about him. As soon as Amy's phone pinged, the man looks at us. He turns to Amy and asks, Who is that texting you? He said it in a way as if to say, I already know. She nervously replies back, 
Oh, it's my dad asking if I got here all right. He squinted his eyes, then continued reading. He started mumbling stuff to himself in a different language. I think it was Polish, but I'm not 100% sure. The bus was due in five minutes by this time, so me and Amy got our stuff together to get ready to get on. We stand up and step towards the road where the bus pulls up. The man also stands up and stands literally a foot away from me. I can feel his breath on my neck. I felt so uncomfortable. I see the bus coming along. We boarded the bus and sat at the back. The man sits at the very front on the seats facing backwards. He puts his book away and stared at me. He stared at me even when I saw him. His glance didn't leave me. Our stop was the next one, so we walked to the driver's section of the bus and waited. The bus pulled up and we left. The man stayed on. We thought he wouldn't see him again. We were so wrong. Later that evening, we had stopped on our hike to have lunch. We sat on a large rock on the top of the hill with forests surrounding us. We were gossiping and laughing till Amy noticed someone walking up the path towards us. Look, she said, isn't that the man from the bus? I turned around and my heart sank. Yes, I replied. Why is he here? He stayed on the bus when we got off. How does he know we would be there? Amy gave me a scared slash confused look and shrugged nervously. We decided to pack up our stuff and head back to the bus station to go home. We were sat at the station and the bus arrived. We got on the bus. The man was nowhere in sight. Last time we saw him, he was on the hike track about three miles from here. He walked past us in the opposite direction. So we go for a few stops when the bus stops and someone gets on. Thinking nothing of it, we continue our conversation when a hand touches my shoulder. Hey. I turn around to see that creepy man standing there, touching my shoulder. How, how can he be here? He, he was miles behind us. How has he got that far in this short of time? It's impossible. Um, yes, I say to him. Can I help you? No, I just wanted to feel you. Immediately creeped out, I stepped up and complained to the driver about what was just said. The driver stops the bus and asks the man to leave. The man gets off, staring at me viciously as he passes me. I sat back down and didn't say a single word all the bus journey back home. We got off the bus and Amy asks me if I'm okay and tells me that I'm looking pale. That was strange, wasn't it? I asked Amy for reassurance that I wasn't over-exaggerating. Hell yeah it was, she instantly responded. We walked back to Amy's and sat in her room for an hour or two. We watched a movie and chatted. Time was getting on and I had to leave so her and her family could have lunch. I walked the short distance home and locked my door behind me. I never usually lock my door, but I was so creeped out. I chucked some lunch in and popped the TV on whilst I ran a bath. I had my lunch then went in the bath. I like to apply a face mask and lay in the bath for ages. So I'm laying there relaxing when I start getting an eerie feeling. I washed my face mask off and quickly washed my hair and jumped out of the bath. I went to my bedroom to put on my pajamas and then went and turned the TV off downstairs and made sure all of my windows and doors were locked. I lay in bed and I keep thinking that I can hear someone outside my home, but I brush it off as a stray dog or another animal. I eventually fell asleep and wake up suddenly during the night. I checked my alarm and it was 3.20 a.m. I don't usually wake up during the night, so I found this a little odd. I sat up and turned my lamp on. I then heard loud footsteps pacing around my house. I got out of bed and checked out of my bedroom window and couldn't see nothing, so I went downstairs. Keeping the downstairs lights off and peeked through the blinds to the front of the house, I saw a person standing there, staring at my bedroom window. I couldn't make out the face. I continued watching as the person paced up and down my driveway. Who could this be, I thought to myself. I had many thoughts like, is this person drunk? Is this an escapee from the asylum up the road? I continued watching for a good 15 minutes until they turned around to walk out. Stopped at my gate, and it's like they turned and looked straight at me. The streetlight was shining on the face, and I recognized the person. It was the man from the bus. How does he know where I live? The man left my driveway and walked off. 
I went back to bed and texted Amy the news in the morning. Oh my god, was her reply. We plan to meet for lunch that day. Lunchtime comes around and we meet at a cafe on the main street. As we're chatting, I notice the man from the bus on the opposite side of the road, walking backwards and forwards down the road, slowing down and staring directly at me as he passes us. I turned to Amy and said, He's here again. He seemed to be everywhere I was that day. I got my nails done. He was there, pacing around. I went grocery shopping. He was there. I started feeling very uncomfortable by this point and went to my local police station to report him. I was told there was nothing they can do as he hadn't actually harmed me in any way, but they did log it down. I left feeling pretty shitty as the police basically turned me away. The next few days got worse and worse. I would see him everywhere I was. I would get woken up in the middle of the night to him beating on my door, yelling to let him in. He loves me. We were meant for each other. All that garbage. My neighbors must have phoned the police one night as I saw blue lights and heard the man yelling, I live here, she's my love, as the police arrested him for a disturbance. I went down and spoke to an officer and told them that I had reported the man already to your department and I hoped that they could do something now. All they did was warn the man to stay away. There wasn't much they could do. It was quiet for a week or two, then I started getting calls from an unknown number. I answered the first few times as I didn't know who it was, and all I heard was deep, heavy breathing down the phone. I hung up and eventually I stopped answering. The calls became constant. I had 54 missed calls within 20 minutes. I went to the police station to report this, and I said I think it's the man who has been stalking me. They had to log it as a different case, as we couldn't prove it was him, with the calls being from an unknown number. I didn't know how he got my number, or why he had such an obsession with me, but I hated it. The calls became worse, where it would be 70 to even 90 missed calls in 20 minutes. There would be days where my phone would not stop ringing, and I would have to turn it off. I eventually changed my number and got no more calls. It's been eight weeks now, and I haven't seen the man, but I have heard weird noises from outside late at night. Nothing has happened yet so far, and I will update if anything does. I've considered the idea of sharing this story for some time now. I never in a million years thought that I would have a story like this to share, and sometimes even I struggle with the fact that it's real. Almost six years ago, I met and fell in love with my husband Vincent, and we have shared an extremely happy life together. Very little in our world has ever been out of place, except for this one issue with a person that I will call Chris. I have never known anyone with a stalker before, and up until this point, I pretty much believe that a stalker is an ex-boyfriend who simply can't let his former girlfriend go. The idea that I would end up stalked by a woman who I never met wasn't even in the realm of possibility, so I had no clue what was in store for me going into my relationship with Vincent. Vincent knew Chris from high school, and she had grown up in his childhood neighborhood as well. They had been semi-friends when they were kids, but that friendship had dwindled in their adult years. Vincent and I had been dating for about four months before I even knew of Chris's existence. He had met my friends and family, and I had met his as well. The subject of a girl named Chris had never come up. One night, while Vincent was staying at my apartment, his phone rang. He answered it and exchanged pleasantries with the person on the other end for a few minutes before telling the person that he was spending some time with his girlfriend and couldn't really talk, and then he said good night and hung up. I've never been one to pry into my partner's phone calls, so I said nothing and went to unpause the movie. He said to me, That was an old friend from high school who calls me every now and again. Her name is Chris. I told him that's nice and we continued the movie. Two nights later, we were again spending an evening together when Chris called. After that, she started calling nearly every night at odd hours. This went on for weeks until Vincent said that Chris wanted to meet. I said that's fine, but he seemed uncomfortable and added, she wants to meet you in a neutral location to discuss what her relationship is with me. Fun fact about me, I don't like drama, and I don't tolerate people who try to cause drama in my life. After he told me this, I consulted with my friends, and they advised me to refuse the meeting, which I did. After I told him I wouldn't meet her, the phone calls became more frequent, 
and took on an abusive quality. She repeatedly advised him to end our relationship and said she could tell that I was clearly abusive and controlling. Vincent assured me that she is harmless and that she will get over the fact that I don't want to meet her and will leave us alone. I decided that I want to put a face to this ranting voice on the other end of the phone. I've read many times that a picture can tell a story, and the pictures I saw clearly told me everything I needed to know about Chris. This person, who is two years younger than me, already looked to be in her mid to late fifties and clearly had a long history with drugs. I sat Vincent down and asked him if she was a drug addict, and that opened the floodgates of truth. This woman, who I have never met but clearly hates me, is a meth addict with multiple children who have all been removed by the state. My defense was immediately on the rise because I wasn't about to let this person into my life or expose my friends and family to her. I told Vincent that I wanted nothing to do with her and he should have nothing to do with her either, to which he agreed. He explained that they had been friends before the drugs and he had distanced himself from her when she started using, that for the most part, he never hears from her unless she has a problem or when he has a girlfriend. If he is seeing someone, she tends to get a little psycho. I was having none of it, and he told me he would distance himself from her further. But the phone calls kept coming, the ranting Facebook messages kept coming, and the disturbances kept getting weirder. She would call and rant to him about how terrible I am, and then demand that he come to her house. She even ranted to me on Facebook about how he needs to start coming to see her once a month, as if we were getting a visitation schedule. Finally, enough was enough, and after he had told her several times to stop bothering us, I sent her a message telling her to leave us alone and good luck with her life. Three days later, she sent him a message saying that he has to meet with her alone or she will do something to ruin our relationship. I told him to ignore her and don't respond. Two days after that, she sent me a long ranting Facebook message that included how Vincent had assaulted her and given her an STD. I was beyond furious and wrote her back, telling her to never contact us again, or I would file a restraining order against her. Another two days passed, and I heard from her again in another ranting message about how he had been calling her from another number. She left the number in question, and it turned out to be a property management company that had never heard of him. After that, Vincent and I called her and put her on speakerphone to tell her to never contact us again or we would be filing a restraining order against her. She agreed to stop bothering us, but then demanded to know how my pet rabbit was doing. Nobody had ever told her that I had a pet rabbit, of course. We just told her goodbye and hung up. We got 11 months of peace, until one day she called again. During the 11 months of peace, our relationship had really blossomed. We stopped worrying about Chris and really didn't give her a single thought. We became engaged, much to the light of friends and family, and we moved in together. Things were really lovely until one day, Vincent came home from work to tell me that Chris had called him crying about her problems again. I was totally furious, and sent her a scathing message via Facebook full of hate and venom. Frankly, I didn't know I could be that wicked, especially to someone who was so obviously beneath me in all aspects of life. Chris definitely brought out the worst in me, but putting up with her special brand of hell would probably push anyone over the edge. I again threatened her with a restraining order, and I really thought that it would end. The very next day, she sent Vincent a message with a threat of violence against me that would turn out to be the first of many. The calls started again. The messages started again. We would block an account online, and she would make another one. She called and texted with various phone numbers and restricted numbers as well. She started writing things about me online about how if she had her way, we would not be together because I would be in a coma that she put me in. I wanted to file for a restraining order, but during this period of time, she moved, and we didn't have an address to send the paperwork. She took full advantage of this fact and continued the harassment, and she was clearly enjoying it. Once she started leaving love songs on Vincent's voicemail at 3 a.m., night after night, we had to change our phone numbers. A dear friend of mine reached out to Chris's husband. Yeah, she was married to tell him the harassment needs to stop. He responded by saying he is fully aware of the situation, but dealing with her is like kicking a hornet's nest, and she'll just turn the situation around. So, she is the one being wronged. It was about this time that another friend of mine sent me a link to a video on YouTube 
that was made by Chris. My friend said, I don't want to upset you, but this video is very disturbing, and it's about you and Vincent. You need to watch it. So I did watch it, and to my horror, there is Chris, sitting in front of a camera, ranting and raving about me, and how I stole her very best friend from her. About how the only reason we were together is because she allows it, and she was using my full name in the video. I looked at the actual YouTube account, and discovered that she had made several videos with similar content. These psychotic ravings were filled with bizarre statements about me and updates about what she had learned about me. They were so full of other things as well. Details about her magical powers, her encounters with shapeshifters, her magic hawk that only she could see, her invisible dragon, and how aliens are out to get her. I was stunned. I again sent her a vicious email demanding that she stop publishing these videos about us, and I also included some very harsh words. After that, she took advantage of the fact that she knew I was watching the videos to speak directly to me. She would go into detail about my work, my personal life, and my co-workers. She explained that I hate her because she is gorgeous, and I can't handle how beautiful she is. Watching her toothless mouth spit out such ridiculous nonsense would have almost been comical if it were not for the fact that she was clearly unhinged and unpredictable. I've only seen my husband angry a few times, and almost always it's been at her. One night, after a rather bad video, he came unglued and called her up screaming. Once she hung up on him, he called her back and left a screaming message on her voicemail. One thing I found curious about this is the next day she made a video about how I had gotten someone else to call her up to harass her. She could never admit it was Vincent, and she could never admit that he hated her. She had this bizarre idea that he was her very best friend and cared deeply for her. She often referred to him as her white knight in shining armor. And once, after the email where I said that he hated her, she made a video where she kept saying over and over, he doesn't hate me. It's like she completely forgot that she had made an assault accusation against this white knight in shining armor. I didn't know how to find her, and we have been told several times that I needed her address in order to serve paperwork on her. She made videos saying she was going to file her own restraining order against me, even claiming she had all the paperwork ready to go. I hoped like hell she would file, because then we could counterfile and present our own case, which now included almost three years of stalking behavior. But she never filed anything against me, and I was incredibly disappointed. I had her location pinned to three different areas, and I decided to call the police in the area I had her most likely as in, and asked what I could do to locate her. The police had a former address for her from some domestic violence calls they had received, but unfortunately she had been evicted from that location, and was again in the wind. That's when the officer told me to create the flyer. I was told that if she was known among the local street people, then if I distributed the flyers with her picture on it and offered a reward for her current location, then I was well within my rights to do so. I felt ridiculous creating and distributing, which was essentially a wanted poster looking for Chris. I even sent one to her husband so he would know how serious I was in finding her and ending the stalking. In his stupidity, he threatened again to have a restraining order put against me, but with 300 bucks on the line, I knew someone in that area would give her up. It took a couple of months, but finally I was contacted by a guy named Walter who knew where she was. I was beyond thrilled. My mother and I met with the manager of the apartment complex Chris was living at, who could not confirm, but also would not deny that this was the address for Chris. She promised to cooperate in full if law enforcement needed to serve the paperwork. Finally. After almost three years of psychotic nonsense from this woman, who I had never met, I received a phone call that an officer had personally put two anti-stalking orders in Chris's hand, one for Vincent and one for myself. Now, we just had to finalize the orders in court. In between the service of the paperwork and the actual court date, the videos mostly dried up. She didn't mention us by name, and mostly just acted like everything was normal in her life. She did make a video where she talked about a vision she had where a car crashes into a business and kills someone inside, and then she described the area in which I work. It was insane revisiting all that crap, but it also made me pity Chris somewhat. Her life was nothing but crap, and she has a very obvious untreated mental illness. 
I was really hoping that the restraining orders would put her on a path to some kind of treatment for either drugs, mental health issues, or both. My number one goal was to permanently remove her from our lives, but I also wanted some good to come out of this for her as well. We headed to court in October of 2016. A couple of friends offered to join us, but we decided it would just be the two of us, along with a crime victim advocate as well. Luckily for me, my mother had to be in her studio all day filming and editing, so she was not able to go. Things would have been really heated if she had been there. Nobody thought Chris would actually show up, and we would just get the order and be done with it. It was 50-50 on her showing up, and I wasn't surprised at all that the elevator door opened and she was there. What did surprise me was how she made her entrance. She came out of the elevator, riding on the back of a woman who must have weighed 400 pounds. She rode her down the hallway and turned the corner. I was absolutely shocked at the ridiculous sight. You don't take this situation seriously at all, do you? I didn't want this day to be a spectacle, but clearly I wasn't going to get my wish. I called my mother at the studio and told her that Chris had actually showed up. My mom asked what she looked like, and I said she looked like a crazy person. She was clearly as unstable as she had appeared in all those videos. After that, she stood against the wall and stared at us silently. I was so grateful for the victim's advocate, because he sat in between her and us, and advised us to just look straight ahead, which was great advice. It all seemed like I was on autopilot, walking into the courtroom, and luckily, we were called after two cases. The judge had read our file, and all we needed to do was prove our case with evidence. Vincent spoke first, and detailed how he had been trying to distance himself from Chris before he had ever met me. I spoke second, and handed over the text messages, blog posts, and a phone record. Both of our testimonies were often interrupted by gasps and loud sighs by Chris, which she had to be scolded by the judge repeatedly. Chris was given a chance to speak, and her statement was almost as bizarre as the videos themselves. She claimed everything she had done was perfectly legal, and tried to use YouTube's terms and conditions to override anti-stalking laws in our state. She then claimed that she was not stalking us and said I was harassing her. She said I had impersonated my sister to contact her husband, and that I had been impersonating another woman and feeding her details about my life in order to stalk me. Basically, she was saying I was stalking myself, which made me produce a gasp of my own. She showed the two angry messages she got from me, demanding she leaves us alone as evidence of my stalking behavior on her. She never once mentioned Vincent's voicemail or his demands to leave us alone, once again refusing to admit that Vincent wants nothing to do with her. The strangest thing was when she waved a large stack of papers saying it's proof that I am stalking myself. The judge refused to view this evidence, which honestly disappointed me, because now I have several unanswered questions as about what all this could have been. I assume it was something she fabricated, but I still wonder what those papers said. After her bizarre testimony, the judge started filling out the paperwork silently while we stood waiting. At one point, Chris asked if she could speak, which the judge immediately said no, and I knew we had won. Vincent squeezed my hand, letting me know that he also knew the judgment. The judge then told us he was granted both orders and read the restrictions placed on Chris. After she had finished with the restrictions, Chris had another outburst and again waved the mysterious papers. After the judge told her to be silent, she announced that the orders would be in effect for five years rather than the standard one year. We left the courthouse feeling a sense of relief that had been almost three years in the making. After court, I went back to work, and my wonderful friends were there waiting for the judgment. Everyone was thrilled that this nightmare had finally been capped, at least for a while. The same day, Vincent showed up to my workplace with a dozen roses, and he was so happy. It's funny because this situation should have been enough to drive us apart, but honestly, it only made our relationship stronger. Chris's whole goal was to ruin our relationship, but she did the exact opposite. Vincent stood by me and defended me through this ordeal and I was able to acknowledge that none of this was his fault. The restraining orders were almost three years old, and honestly we both believe that Chris will resurface at some point. At one point after the restraining orders were placed, Chris called Vincent's best friend and demanded Vincent's phone number. I don't think we're lucky enough to have not heard the last from her, but we have made every effort to shut her out of our life. We got married and moved away so she won't know where we live anymore. I don't let Chris occupy my thoughts anymore. I don't check for videos, and I even blocked her YouTube account to prevent any videos from popping up in my feed. 
I have it on good authority that she is still making crazy ranting videos with mine and Vincent's names left out. But frankly, I have no interest in hearing her voice. She just isn't worth my time or effort when I have so much good going on in my life. She can believe what she wants about me. I don't really care anymore. Honestly, most of my anger is faded, and I'll have only pity left. I really hope she gets help and moves on with her life. So you might be wondering why I'm sharing this story. When we were in the thick of this situation, there was very little information on female stalkers or dealing with a stalker that you have never met. Most law enforcers would say, who is the guy? Assuming it was a male perpetrator. We also found very little support for a man being stalked by a woman. If this story makes one person who is in a similar situation feel like they are not alone, then it's worth it for me to share it. A few years ago, while I was still in university, I was in a serious relationship with this guy who I thought was perfect for me. My parents liked him, he got along with all my friends, and frankly, I thought I was the luckiest girl alive. He was on his exchange semester in my city, and about five to six months into the relationship, he suggested transferring to my city. I thought that would be great, and helped him out with his application. A few months passed by. He extends his exchange semester, and we were closer than ever, even living together at this point. One day, I was at work, in a summer internship. He got accepted into my university and forwarded the email to me. I was overjoyed, and my friends were extremely thrilled as well. It felt like a fairy tale come true. We then started looking for apartments and making other arrangements for his move. A few weeks before classes were supposed to start, he flew back to his home country to visit his parents. I did the same, and we planned to come back in two weeks. Two weeks later, I fly back out for university, but he didn't. He tells me his dad is really sick, and he has to stay home to take care of him for a few weeks. I didn't think much of it, but then a few weeks later, he tells me that the university emailed him and told him to join in next semester as he already missed out on a few weeks of classes. I thought that was super weird, but then he forwarded all the emails that the university sent him, so I had no reason to believe he was lying. Even though he wasn't attending classes in my country, he would come visit me every month, which was great. A few months pass. The next semester rolls in. He doesn't show up for the first week of class. And when I ask him about it, he says he's really sick and will fly in the following week. He sends me his flight tickets, apartment lease contract, and student visa documents. So again, I have no reason to doubt him. The following week rolls in and he sends me snaps of him boarding the flight. At this point, I'm super excited to see him. And I go wait for him outside of his apartment once the flight lands. It's been an hour since the flight landed, and I don't see him pull up outside the apartment. I ask him where he is, and he says the airport isn't letting him leave because his visa had expired, and that he has to fly back to his home country. My roommate goes down to the university office to figure out why his visa was expired, and they say they have no records of him as a student at my university. My ex then gets really mad over the call, and says that the university lost his record, even though they told him to delay his semester. He tells me to hang tight and that his dad will fly in soon to sort it out with the university. At this point, I'm super confused, so I go to the office in his apartment to check if he had paid his deposit. Surprisingly, he did, and it was around $6,000, so I thought that there was no way that he would blow that amount of money for no reason. So I believe his story, and just wait for his dad to sort things out with the university. A few days pass, and I'm just waiting in my room and looking for his acceptance letter, when I notice his student number looks oddly familiar. I open up my acceptance letter and realize I have the exact same student number. That's when I realize he had forged all my documents and had manipulated my friends and I into believing he was a student at my university. I confronted him and he said that he did all this for me and that he would find a way to be with me. Till this day, I can never trust anything a guy says to me. So, my ex-boyfriend, if you're reading this, please don't try to come see me again.
This is my first time ever posting on Reddit, and I'm not a writer, and I'm writing this on mobile. This is something that happened to me a long time ago, and I am now a much older and wiser woman. I was 20, and I moved from northwestern England to live and work in London. I had no real experience of relationships. On the outside, I appeared extroverted and quite tough, but on the inside, I had no self-confidence. I looked in the mirror, and all I could see was a fat, ugly, aggressive, and unlikable person. I now see that none of that was true, but it meant that I was vulnerable. I met a man, Robert. He was 27 years old. We dated, and six months later, I moved into his flat. There were loads of red flags, which I stupidly ignored until I was living in a nightmare. It started with control and emotional abuse. Now, I grew up in a very rough city in northwestern England and I could handle myself and had a quick temper. So at the beginning, I gave as good as I got, but it escalated to him cheating on me, physically assaulting me, locking me in the flat, isolating me, mind games, and taking my money. There were too many incidents to write about here, but suffice to stay in that 12-month relationship, he terrorized me until I hardly recognized myself. I was desperate to escape, But deep down, I always knew that when I left him, I would be in danger, so I just kept putting it off. One day, he started another fight, but this time, he told me to get out. I didn't need to be told twice. I packed my stuff and was gone within ten minutes. I had no close friends because he would be so vile that nobody stayed around for very long. I rang a girl that I used to work with and begged her to let me stay with her for the night. She gave me her address, and she let me stay with her for a month in her flat, which was about a mile away from his flat in northwest London. This meant I had to use the same tube station to get to work. It started one morning when he was waiting at the tube station. I heard the words, You effing slag, in my ear, and I ran through the morning rush hour crowd to the train with my heart pounding. He escalated it from that point onwards. He would be at the tube station waiting for me a couple times a week. He would stand behind me as I got my ticket and would verbally abuse me. He would never shout or draw attention to himself, but he would call me names and threaten me in a low tone of voice that made my stomach heave. I never reacted because I knew that's what he wanted. I foolishly hoped that he would get fed up and just leave me alone. Then he started to show up in the neighborhood around my workplace in West London. I told my manager and colleagues that this was before mobile phones were commonly used. Other than keeping an eye out for him, they couldn't really do much to help me. Sometimes I would see him at a distance standing in a corner, or catch a glimpse of him in a local market, and then he would vanish. I thought I was going mad or developing paranoia. I moved out of my friend's flat into a shared house about a mile and a half away from him. I don't know any other areas of London, and I had made some friends in that area so I didn't want to leave completely. I used the same tube station, and as I stopped seeing him there, I thought he was starting to move on. It took me a couple of weeks to notice the white van with blacked out windows that was permanently parked across the road from my flat. I thought it belonged to a neighbor. I was horrified when I realized it was him, and he would sit in that van day and night, watching me and tracking my movements. One day, soon after the van appeared, He approached one of my housemates to give me a message and asked for the telephone number. I wasn't that friendly with my housemates, so I hadn't told them what was going on. They thought that he was a friend and gave him the number. From then on, he rang every night all through the night. Eventually, I told my housemates what was happening, and they promised not to let him and unplugged the phone that night. He started to leave gifts and cards on my doorstep. My room was on the ground floor, and a brick was thrown through my window. I'm phobic about birds and keep finding dead birds on my windowsill. I was a nervous wreck, flinching at shadows and jumping out the slightest sound. I thought about moving again, but I knew he would find me through my workplace. I went to the police, who said because he hadn't actually done anything, then there was nothing they could do. This was before stalking was a criminal offense in the UK. I would come home and find typed letters posted through the door asking me why had I been to a certain shop or cafe or theater on a certain day or night. The letters would ask me why I had visited a certain address and who lived there. It was relentless, 
And I knew that he was letting me know that he was there watching all the time. I wanted to leave London and go back home, but I couldn't tell my family what was happening as my mother was seriously ill. And I didn't want to worry my dad and my siblings as they had enough to deal with. In desperation, I decided to pretend that I left London by packing a couple of suitcases and taking them back to my home city. I knew he would be watching me, and I hoped that he would be fooled. I totally underestimated his lunacy. I would stay at my best mate's house when I returned home. I thought I saw him once, but I thought I was just being paranoid. The night after I arrived, I went out for a couple of drinks with my best friend Diane and two other friends, Billy and John. We went to a couple of bars, listened to some music, then all ended up back at her house just drinking and chatting. Billy and John left around 3 a.m. A couple of days later, I returned to London. There was a note waiting for me on the doormat. I opened it, and to my horror, it contained details of my night out, along with threats about what would happen to me for being a cheating slag. It mentioned John. It named bars where we had drank, and even the name of the band. Then he rang the house phone, screaming and ranting words that made no sense. I saw one of his friends who told me that, unbeknownst to me, the crazy ex had drove 200 miles and gone straight to my best friend's house. He had watched me go out and waited for me to return home from the night out. Then he followed John and waited outside his house too. The following day, when John went to his local pub for a Sunday afternoon drink, my maniac ex followed John in there and made a point of chatting with him to find out his name, etc., This had gone on for about four months at this point. About a month later, I was on my way home from work. It was winter, around 7 p.m. and the streets were dark. He grabbed me on a side street, dragged me into the back of the van. I was petrified and crying in the dark, being thrown from side to side. All I could hear was the radio. He hadn't said a word. After about an hour, the van stopped and the back door opened and I was in an empty car park with trees around it. He kept his hand on the back of my neck as he made me walk for about 20 minutes through what I guessed was a forest. He never said a word as I asked him where we were going, and why he was doing this. It was as though he was deaf because he didn't even acknowledge what I was saying. The night was freezing and there were no lights other than his torch. I don't know how many times I fell over and got dragged back up to my feet. Eventually, we reached a sort of clearing, and he pulled me behind a tree with a stick and plastic bag tied to it. Then he showed me a shallow rectangular hole in the ground and said that that was my grave and that he would happily go to prison knowing that I was dead because of all the pain that I had caused him. He pulled a short, thin blue rope from his pocket, and at that point, he looked unrecognizable. His expression was pure darkness, and all I could see was his crazy eyes staring right through me. He had his hand on my throat and the rope in his other hand. I swear I have never been so scared in my life. I was shaking with terror. I honestly thought that forest clearing would be the last place I would ever see again in this world. Suddenly, I knew with complete certainty that I had to stay calm if I was going to get out of this alive. I told him he didn't need to do this, that I knew I was wrong to make him mad. It was all my fault and I was sorry. I told him we could get back together, and I knew now that he really loved me. In the end, God knows how, but somehow I got through to him, and his eyes cleared and he spoke to me. He agreed to let me go and get my things to move back in with him. He drove me back to my flat and I ran inside and collapsed on the floor while he waited outside. He started beeping his horn, banging on the door, and ranting and raving outside the house. My housemate rang the police but he left as they arrived in the street. I gave him his details and told them what had happened. He denied everything, and the police said that there was no witnesses, so it was my word against his. The police told me they had warned him, but ultimately they couldn't do anything without proof. I gave them the notes he had left, the van registration, the names of people who could verify what I was saying, but still, they said it wasn't enough to arrest him and charge him. They checked the van registration, but it wasn't registered to his name. And so, the stalking and harassment continued. I started carrying a R alarm, hairspray, a screwdriver, 
and anything else that I thought might protect me. I hadn't slept properly for weeks, and food stuck in my throat if I tried to eat. I was a shadow of my normal self. Friends of his came to see me, to tell me to leave London, as he was obsessed with revenge because I had been to the police. I went to a solicitor who wrote a cease and desist letter. I found parts of it ripped on my doorstep. About six months from the start of his terror campaign, I was asked out on a date by Gary, who was a friend of my friend's boyfriend, Pete. I was trying to convince myself that I could carry on living with some semblance of normality. I agreed to go out with Gary if Pete came along too. After a few drinks, we went to the club. Pete, who wasn't drinking, said he would give us a lift home. We were in Pete's car, and he started the engine and drove for about five minutes. Then I heard Pete say, There's something wrong with my brakes. Then he said, There's a white van following us. My heart started beating 100 miles per hour, and my throat started to close as I asked him, Does the van have the reg number 1234? To my horror, it did. It was him following us. I quickly had to explain to Pete and Gary that I had a lunatic ex-boyfriend who just happened to be stalking me right at that very moment. Pete was only driving at about 20 miles per hour. He pulled the car over, and we jumped out and ran through a housing estate of tenant flats until we lost him. We found a mini cab office, and as I was too scared to go back to my flat, I ended up sleeping on Gary's couch. Unsurprisingly, the potential new relationship ended that night. The next day, Gary rang me to say that he had been back to pick up his car, and the brake cable had been partially cut until it was nearly severed. I truly believe he tried to kill all three of us that night. Gary and Pete wanted me to go to the police, but I had lost all faith in them. Every time I had asked the police to help me, they had done nothing, and it just made things worse by reinforcing how powerless I was. Enough was enough. I knew that he wasn't going to stop. I didn't even know what he wanted anymore. That same week, I gave notice on my flat and handed in my notice at work. I booked a six-month air ticket to India. In my crazy mind, I thought, well, it's one of the most populated places on the planet, so he will never find me there. I traveled around India on my own for six months. I did a lot of thinking and healing and returned to my home city. I never returned to London. And thank God, I never saw him again. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Good night, everybody. And I'll read to you in the next video.